let Rick take over. Rick Smith. Thanks, Tony. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I uh, didn't really know where to get started. I'm going to try to uh, go through uh, and make this interesting. Uh, I geared it maybe towards my students. Uh, I see a lot of students. How many of you guys from Emerson, Berkeley, Lowell, New England Institute of Art? All right. Uh, anyway, so I geared it a lot towards those guys. Hopefully I've got a little something interesting uh, for you if you're not in the television sports business. I don't see any uh, direct colleagues out here, but that doesn't mean you're not in the business. Uh, it just means I haven't run across you in, in, in these years. I thought, uh, I didn't really know how to get started today, and, and uh, then on the way over here driving from the college, I kind of had this idea that I'd start with a story. Uh, uh, and this, is, this probably occurred eight or nine years ago. Uh, I was mixing a show for the Oakland A's uh, television network, whoever they were at the time. Uh, I was called Fox Sports West Coast or whatever. This was my primary means of business at the time, was these uh, uh, away shows, these visiting shows would come in, they'd hire a local television crew. Anyway, so I'm mixing for this guy, and I'm trying to make the director happy. He's unhappy. The bat crack mics aren't loud enough for this guy. And, and if you can understand the chaos of a television show, he says, audio, I need more bat crack. So this is, this is all he says to me. So I said, all right. So I bring up the bat crack mics. Audio, I need more bat crack. And I'm, I'm going, oh, this is the level now, the balance between his announcers and the, bat cra and the, and the crowd now, which is coming up with the bat crack mics, is getting to the point where I'm not comfortable. But he says, I want more bat crack. So I bring him up some more, a little bit more. Finally, he says, no, I need more bat crack. So I ramped him up now, and I said, well, okay, he's in charge, right? So now the crowd is definitely overwhelming the intelligibility of the announcers. And he goes, audio, what the hell happened? I can't hear my announcers. And if you, again, if you understand the chaos of the television show, when he's calling camera shots, et cetera, et cetera, he doesn't, it's not really a good point for me to say, uh, you know, well, and explain that, well, the, the, the crowd mics at Fenway Park or the bat crack mics are mounted on the backstop and pointed, and even though they're shotgun mics, they're picking up some of the crowd and some of the, from, from some of the side angles and the crowd facing from left field, yelling. And I said, so I didn't really have time to do this, and he was getting very frustrated, and finally I said, well, why don't you come back here and mix it yourself? Now, <laughs> this okay. Well, some of you guys get that that is the punchline. Uh, it's I, I've got some notoriety now within local camera crews for having said this, having the the gall to say this to a director. Uh, and I think that's that's maybe the important point that I'm trying to get at is the dynamics of the show in in television. As an audio engineer, means you're a small piece to the puzzle. Television audio guy is an afterthought. Usually, usually if you're doing audio for TV, uh, you're only noticed if you're screwing something up. Uh, so, uh, and I think that what's interesting for me now, with hindsight, besides that I had that much gall at that point, and that I still worked in the business after that, <laughs> uh, was that was was how notorious this was then. This became a, a famous. Uh, within the circle of television crews, this became like a, a famous story for people to tell. And again, I think that maybe is a good introduction to sort of the dynamics of the environment that a television sports person is mixing in. Uh, so I, I wanted to start uh, just with you guys, and I, and I think the other nice thing about that story is I think it says, it gives you an introduction to what kind of work I've done. I've done television sports work for almost 20 years. I start. I think my first show was in 1990. You know, in the spring, the Bruins were in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and every television sports person in New England and maybe New York was in Boston working, and they were desperate to hire somebody, and they were willing to hire a guy on just word of mouth from somebody I had worked with on an internship in college. I was basically a fresh-faced kid just out of college. 
But anyway, I started A2ing then. A2ing is the assistant. I'll get into that a little later. And I started mixing somewhere around 93, 94. And I, and I did that for a living ever since, and ever until I took the, the full-time job at New England Institute of Art. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I want to do uh, for starters in the PowerPoint was just give you some pictures. Now, I'm, full disclosure here, I didn't take this picture. I wasn't actually at these Olympics, but I do know Al Troutwood. And I know him from when he worked with the New York Yankees, and I would A2 for him. He would do the on-field interviews back in the day. Uh, so this is, this is just a few behind-the-scenes pictures. You guys might know these guys. That's uh, another Olympic booth. That's a typical position of a cameraman on a long shoot. Uh, you, uh, are there any cameramen out here? Good, so I can, have, I can publicly show my animosity towards camera operators. Uh, that's Fenway Park. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting, especially for students, to find out who else was doing uh, this kind of work in the area. What's interesting about this is maybe, I don't know if it's how many or how few, or just that I could go through my phone and find all these guys and to show how connected the business was. Television Sports uh, is a reasonably small community, uh, and we're hooked in also uh, fairly loosely also with engineers from New York, Pitts, uh, Philly, Pittsburgh, all over the country. Uh, so uh, that's, what, that's what that's about. Uh, we're working out of, again, to try to give you an, an idea, background of what the environment is. Uh, mobile television trucks are basically studios on wheels, television studios on wheels. Uh, with, uh, and you see they're, they're, most of them come in this expando fashion, where, uh, so you get actually some more people room inside the truck once, once you're parked up. Oh, that didn't come back out nearly as nice as I thought. Well, that's a, that's a truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's an overhead view of a truck. That looked better on my home uh, computer than it does here. Uh, who are they working for? Uh, there's, there's really not that many people who are hiring these kind of uh, television engineers. Uh, and, this, and the other thing is, is you're wrapped in sort of a different crewing world. You're, you're not in a world of audio engineers anymore. Your, your hiring world is now television people. So you're, you're, in, you're in the television world. This is important also, I think. I don't know of a single full-time television sports person, whether it's a cameraman, tape operator, tel a TD, audio engineer. All of the work is freelance work. Uh, so if you're, you, you need, you're gonna be dealing with you know, your own taxes and stuff if you get into this line of work. It's not uncommon in the business. I, I imagine that those of you guys who are in uh, most, most avenues in, in uh, audio that involve actual production work are, are working on freelance basis. This is important. Again, I put this up for students. What are you paid in this business? Uh, 35 is, is uh, probably A2 level. 60 is on the high end of A1 level for this kind of work per day. The nice thing is, is you're guaranteed a 10-hour day when you're doing this kind of work. Now, the thing to keep in mind is, is that nobody's, nobody's helping you with your Social Security on your taxes. Nobody's helping you with your health insurance costs. So these costs are added on top. The, another thing that's, uh, uh, you, that is easy to forget about in this business is a lot of times a day of work actually eats up two or three days of your life. Uh, a 4 a.m. crew call eats up, eats up your ability to work the night before. Uh, a job that puts you home at 2 in the morning eats up your ability to do a 4 a.m. crew call the next day. Uh, so you have to be careful when you're scheduling as well that uh, you're, you're not limiting yourself uh, for a number of days you can do. Now, obviously, with uh, uh, overtime being accumulated over 10-hour day, sometimes it's beneficial to work a 20-hour day in a row gain all that overtime and, and screw the day before and the day after, right? I mean, those, those are a wash. You're actually making more by, by doing the extra overtime, if you, can, if you can plan it. It's hard to plan that, and usually it's just dumb luck. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw these words around a lot. I'm going to give you an introduction to the 
personnel on a TV crew, for starters. The A1 is uh, the guy who actually mixes the show, uh, makes decisions about where microphones are placed, makes decisions about how, uh, how the show's gonna be put together, uh, the signal flow. Uh, it's a contact person also from audio with production, finds out what production's needs are for that particular show. That's me. That's me too. Thanks, Ronnie. Nice. Uh, the A2 uh, is, in my estimation, actually the more important person on uh, the audio crew uh, because, and actually, the, the, well, I wouldn't say the person has to work harder, but it's physically more demanding. Uh, running cable to all the various locations, and, and sometimes even with a football game, you're talking about thousands of feet between the football field and the television truck by the time you get out to the end XLR. You might be dealing with 250 to 500 feet worth of, worth of molts, which is what, what a uh, television person calls a snake. Uh, and, then, and then additionally, uh, 300 feet of cable on top of that to a remote microphone position is not unheard of in a, in a sports setting. Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, the number of A2s on a show varies pretty dramatically. On a smaller show, you'd be looking at uh, uh, an one, one or two A2s on a show. There's a lot of shows that are away shows, for instance, at the Boston Garden, where one A2 is all that's needed to set up the different uh, locations. On a bigger show, uh, say a World Series level show, playoff level show, a uh, show where people bring in uh, a whole ton of production, you might be looking at 15 A2s on a show, which is a lot of people to coordinate, and that usually involves people traveling in, plus some local people who know the particular venue. Uh, when you get to that level, you're usually looking at an A2, A2s who are in more specific positions, and some examples would be an A2 who's assigned to pre-mix the microphones on the field for the, for the A1, or maybe pre-mix a band for the A1, maybe an A2 designed to mix some sources that are going to be in the PA, uh, which would be, say, in a theater, in a, in a setting where you're, you have a live studio audience. Uh, the a, an A2 would also typically maybe an RF specialist, uh, maybe someone assigned just to do communications. Uh, communications is a big part of television audio. And also an A2 to sort of be uh, what uh, what is typically called a compound A2 or booth bitch, uh, which means that a, he or she is the person who's assigned to the A1 to deflect uh, anyone who comes by. You guys, you know, Rick, you know how it is. Uh, you, you're trying to mix, you're trying to get some things set up, and 15 people are all of a sudden on you with information that's extremely important, or uh, they're, they're coming to you with questions that don't belong at the audio room. Uh, you'd be surprised how often somebody comes and goes, hey, uh, can we get a DVD made of the show? And they come to the audio room. And say, uh, I'm busy. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> some of the other people, well, there's uh, one of the local <coughs> who's Brian at uh, Gillette Stadium. One of the things you'll find if you get into the business is you learn a lot of uh, a lot of the ways things are done at particular buildings. Gillette Stadium has a patch panel. Nobody from Gillette Stadium knows that patch panel. Television engineers who have worked there before know that tie panel. And if you show up and you've never been at the building before, you have to decode it. And, and oftentimes, that means getting on the phone with one, one of those people I, I showed earlier, saying, uh, hey, Brian, you've worked at Gillette. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to decode this, uh, this logic they have here. What does near northwest corner mean? Where, where are they talking about? Uh, so it, it actually becomes real helpful if you're working in the same location, same locations. And uh, the, the people I mentioned will know the tie panels at the Boston Garden, Fenway Park, Gillette Stadium, BC. BC has a uh, horrible one. No, it's not horrible. I, it's... Uh, it's actually much better than it used to be. Uh, who are the people in your neighborhood? Uh, yeah, I'm in the Sesame Street generation. 
Uh, anyway, the producer and director are the people who are uh, in, in charge of the whole production. If you're an A1, you're going to work with one or two of these guys, and uh, you're going to find you're going to have to decipher their language, find out what that really means for you. Sometimes it means having to say things like, "Okay, you you do understand that if I'm going to put a microphone on the light post on top of the green monster." in case somebody hits a home run there to hit it, that I'm going to need an A2 here yesterday so with a cable crew to run the wires up there for you. And so you have to explain sort of things like this. They're not necessarily thinking in terms of audio all the time. So, uh, And that's a difficult thing when you're young in the business is, is trying to explain this because they're all my age and they're intimidating when you're a young person. Now, now that I'm my age, it's a lot easier to say, uh, listen, we're, we're, we can't reinvent the wheel here without more personnel. Uh, but anyway, these, these guys are usually really good at pictures and not so good at, uh, good at audio. Uh, that's a picture of the, the front of the bus. This is uh, what production looks like. This is actually in uh, NCP's, actually, this might be Game Creek, now that I'm looking at it. I might have labeled that wrong. Uh, but th that's in one of the mobile production trucks that, that I worked in over the summer. Thanks, Desmond. NCP. That is NCP? Okay. You, another thing you'll, you'll find is there's a fleet of mobile production trucks, and you get to work in a whole bunch of these as time goes on. And uh, none of them are built this, exactly the same. Tech manager is going to be your boss on the day of the show. Uh, he's in charge of exactly what you think. On a smaller show, you might not have a tech manager. His duties might be split. Uh, specifically, things like trying to make sure you don't waste the client's money uh, would, would be uh, put on the director or someone else on the crew to call, to call out times and things like that, and to make sure everyone gets to lunch. Make sure you get a meal penalty if you deserve one. These next guys uh, travel with the trucks. Uh, engineering. These guys are your friend. They fix stuff. A lot of these guys are actually audio engineers uh, who were technically good at fix it, repairing and maintenance and went into this because it's actually a fairly lucrative job, although the time it, it takes being on the road, in this case, these guys are the first ones on a show every day and the last ones to leave every day to make sure everything's inventoried and put away, uh, to make sure that the truck's in good working order. There's a lot of pressure on these guys, but for a technically savvy person, uh, it's, a ni it's a nice one. I'm, I'm talking three-figure job to be a, a truck engineer. It's, it's, really a, it's really a pretty lucrative business if you don't mind being on the road all your life. And my good buddy John Roderick at the patch field. Try, when I asked a question like, where are the IFB program inputs? This is what he does. <clears throat> I just put this on just to show some of the equipment storage in some of the trucks. This is actually in uh, a B unit. Uh, a lot of times uh, equipment, including <coughs> high-end $1,000 plus microphones, are just packed in crates. You see this is, this is actually, uh, I don't know if you can see that. I, I believe those are MKH-70s. Anybody familiar with the MKH-70? It's, it's not a cheap little shotgun microphone, and, and they have just PVC that those guys are stuck in. That's their, that's their packing at the end of the day. Uh, a lot of times these are just uh, stuffed in a big crate and, and dumped under a truck. All right, I found that interesting. <laughs> uh, TV, camera ops. Uh, I'll try not to have too much animosity towards camera uh, people, uh, but these guys are like, uh, how many of you guys do live sound? Anybody do live sound? For, uh, you, you always know the lead guitarist always wants to hear more of himself. Well, these guys are the lead guitarists of, of the television <laughs> world. Uh, you, you, you know, they have that personality. They, they really feel like they're the most important guy because they're that connection between the, what the people see at home. And uh, Anyway, uh, uh, I'm not sure who that is, but this was a great picture of the... Uh, uh, my friend Bob Qua sent this to me. It's a great picture of the command center that a TD has to deal with. A TD is also sometimes called a switcher. I think in England they might be even called a painter. Uh, they, they're actually, they're actually uh, or a vision mixer. They actually mix, they're the equivalent of the audio engineer, 
in the video world. Although they don't do any kind of spectral processing, they're just involved in the actual mix. The spectral processing, Tom Gilmet. Uh, spectral processing in, in the video world is done with, in another control room, video. I'll get to that. Uh, tape, these guys record, record all the individual sources from the show, plus the full show. Uh, you're going to need to coordinate with these guys if you're an A1 because you need to make sure they're getting the correct signals to the tape. One of the important uh, playback sources that you have is video replays on your show. Sometimes that's in the form of uh, an interview. Uh, sometimes that's in the form of, of a replay from, from the show. Video, uh, paint the cameras. These guys are sort of the EQ, just responsible for the EQ of the cameras, what I consider EQ. This is to make sure that the, the cameras have the, a similar look. So when you go from camera to camera, they have, they, they, it doesn't look, the irises are very similar. The lighting balance is similar. The color balance is similar. Uh, graphics puts the graphics into the show. Uh, it used to be that you never talked to a graphics guy except to show him how to use his headset. Uh, nowadays you have to coordinate with the graphics people because so many of the devices that they're animating, so many of their animations are also playing sound. And that's an element that you have to get a, a checked and then balance into your, into your program. Now, this next section, I tried to go through that as fast as I could as a, as a little introduction. I, I should stop here. Does anyone have any questions about what I've, what I've uh, covered so far? I know it's kind of a bang, bang introduction to the whole uh, world of television. None so far? Yeah, Kirk. Yeah, at the bottom of the tape slide, it says that you need a 30-minute fax check. Yep. Uh, you know, I don't know why they call oh, facsimile, I guess. It's probably why you call it a fax check. Basically, it's a, uh, it's a, a routing check. And uh, again, it's television verbiage, uh, which is we're going to fax that. And fax that means we're going to check and make sure everything's working properly. And from tape, that means um, <coughs> making sure these days it's usually four channels of audio from each tape machine. And it means making sure that, and they're usually grouped in two, two groups of stereo. So channels one and two are, are your primary stereo. Three and four are your backup stereo records on that machine. And so it's making sure that one and two are getting to you with proper level and in, in, in correct polarity. And then also checking channels three and four, making sure they're coming with proper level and proper polarity. When you get into the realm of having uh, say 25 tape machines, which isn't unusual anymore on a TV sports production. When I started in the business, it was common to be on a show with two stereo machines. Uh, now I'm doing shows where I sometimes have, what, 20, 20 times four is 80, 80 channels of tape machine is, is, uh, is not uncommon these days. And, uh, and those are all sources that, that you need to have available in your, in your desk because uh, they, they might come depending on what production has in mind. Now, typically there's two or three primary tape sources, uh, but you need to have access to all of those. So that's why it can take a while to get it all checked out. Uh, when you're dealing with an analog world, you're often uh, trying to make sure that DAs are set properly and to make sure that patches are, are getting a full signal. A lot of times you'll, it's just a matter of exercising the patch cable, right? If you have a, a, a lower signal level coming out. In the digital world, usually it's, a, it's, a on, it's an on or off, right? Is it working? Is it not working? A lot of times then the mistakes are just simply made in routing. There's a lot of places routing mistakes can be made, which, which is where I guess I'm headed next. Great, one question. Yeah. The switch from analog broadcast to digital has that affected yeah, um, it, in in weird in weird ways, uh, it's it's mostly now that now that we're dealing with digital uh, fiber fiber uh, transmission instead of uh, an analog uh, satellite transmission. There's many more channels of audio available, and uh, I I actually have a slide that that gets to that. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll jump ahead here. 
come back just on up. Yeah, that's the good thing about this slow computer. Here we go. Uh, in, in analog transmission, uh, it's not uncommon to have, it wasn't uncommon to have several stereo paths. Uh, but typically, your typical show would just have a stereo mix and a NAT sound mix. NAT sound meaning everything in it but the announcers and music. So a NAT sound mix was for, uh, a, for instance, would be ESPN would want a NAT sound mix so that later on they could build a, a, a replay package on their Sports Center show and they could play back the sounds that were occurring at that time with the pictures that were occurring that time, but put their own announcing music over it. Uh, an international mix is a little bit more complicated. It includes everything but the announcers in it, and that's so that in real time, someone back at ESPN, and this is, again, this is a, their for instance, uh, can be broadcasting in another language, and that would be for their international, uh, you know, me Mexican, or whatever, whatever, or, you know, even uh, American, uh, Spanish language broadcast. Now, now that we're in digital transmission, uh, you're, you, it's not uncommon for me to be building uh, a surround mix, which is a 5-1 surround mix, a uh, stereo mix, a NAT sound mix, and uh, SAP, I, I threw that on there. That's a, uh, a again, uh, say, uh, to add an, uh, a foreign language uh, mix, on, mix on top of it. Uh, it, it might also be for uh, the hearing impaired, uh, but, but uh, four stereo stems are now available with a digital transmission very easily, and these all have to be tested. And when you're testing the surround mix now, you test the stems, but then also you test the individual components to the surround. The surround mix is, uh, is uh, uh, the 5-1, the, the six channels of the 5-1. Coded to two channels, so you have to check both those two channels, but then also left, center, right, surround, left, surround, right, and and uh, so, so the, the the change I guess isn't that great. It's just that there's there's more to deal with these right. days. Well, yeah. Just before we leave that. Yeah, so yeah. In <coughs> live digital, do you have the same sync problems that they have a lot in HD? Uh, for tape programs, uh, a lot of that going on. Is that, retrans is that just retransmission from locals or? No, no. Uh, a lot of times, I th I think now this is this is you're getting out of my my uh, my areas of expertise here, right? But uh, I think a lot of times the problem is in a sync between all all of this gets encoded into one transmission path, one transmission stream down one fiber and along with video. And I believe a lot of times there's a sync problem between the encoding and the decoding back at the station where these stems are then, are, are then separated again. So, so sync becomes a big problem. Now with, within the truck, uh, within a production truck, sync is usually nothing, something that I don't have to worry about because there's a master clock and everything, including the, the console, the video switcher, the video uh, cameras, the tape machines, everything is clocked from the same source. Uh, so, so sync is, is not something I've ever had to deal with internally. Yeah. When you say tape machine, is that a physical tape recorder? You, you know, that's a great question. Uh, we're still calling it that, but just like you'd still call it a record, yeah. uh, <laughs> most, most of them today are actually uh, uh, vir virtual or, you know, hard drive driven machines. Uh, a company called EVS uh, is the one that's mostly used <coughs> in the business. And, uh, but they're, be they're, believe it or not, again, this is a Ripley's believe it or not, there's still actual tape being recorded and it's usually digibated, uh, which, is, which is still a for Yeah, I, I, go figure. I worked on a show this fall where somebody wanted a record to regular beta still believe it or not, because they were still using regular beta for yeah, some probably. things back at the, yeah, yeah, crazy. So, yeah. Thank you. It, yeah, no, yeah. I was curious about, um, with all the uh, 
then playback sources and stuff, and the replay is happening very, very quickly. How do you keep on top of that? And is any of that controlled by like the tally from the from the uh, video switcher at all? That's or, a, is, or are you doing everything? This is an excellent question too. Uh, now. Some of the sources actually do, I do uh, trigger, trigger with a tally. And, and an example would be uh, an effect off the video switcher. Let's say the swoosh, you guys are all familiar with that, the whoosh, when they, when they go to a replay, that white move or whatever. Uh, that's usually triggered off a of GPI, and I can just leave the fader up. Uh, same with those graphics decks I was talking about before. The graphics decks, it's a consistent, um, uh, sound effect, and it's a con pretty fairly consistent level. So that's that's a source that I'll typically let uh, be triggered, leave up, and be triggered. And also, that's a source that I don't get enough of a call from the director on that, that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, with regular tape machines, Elvis machines, uh, anything coming from the tape room, you actually need to. Uh, to, to mix that in and out. And the, the reason for that is there's often times when that machine will be playing and on the air, but they won't want sound with it. Uh, so there's times when the machine's playing on the air and there you do and, and the director does want sound, times when it's playing when, when the director doesn't want sound. And so you need to physically be be prepared to to uh, to bring that up and down. So do you have a multi coming from from the video I think I think today uh, most of the GPIs usually you get like two or three GPIs, three maybe four on some of them. A, a lot of the sources I don't even worry about a GPI uh, because if it's supposed to play sound when the machine plays, it'll play it, and if it's not, they won't play it. Uh, the sources that I have to be careful for and I put a GPI, uh, there's usually three or four GPIs that I can do. With most of the tape room, though, those 80 or so source channels I was talking about, I, I just want to have a lot of board real estate, just a, just a lot of a lot of faders, and I have to, and you have to pay attention. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the hardest parts is is anticipating, listening uh, for what the director's calling in video, and anticipating that there might be maybe some audio involved with it. So if the director's readying a tape machine. Getting your hand to that fa that set of faders, and if, then if he says, track it, which is which is my cue now, in amongst all the everything else he's saying, that's when I bring it onto the air. So uh, it's really up to uh, the director in that case to, to be a good communicator also. And can, and I'm going to gripe again here for a second because if the director is not a good communicator, and I neglect to bring it up when I should, or if I bring it up when I shouldn't. I look like a bad guy, and and that's whether or not the director made the correct call to me, or you know, or I misinterpreted the director's call. So you know, th there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of feel involved in it, it's, uh, which is always scary. When I'm not there and thinking about it, it's scarier than when I'm actually there in the middle of it. With, with the hard hard this playback, are they doing less queuing up of, of tapes that you don't want? To yeah, I think that's a good that's a good uh, that's that's a fair statement. Uh, also, uh, with their ability to to have precision cues, there's a lot less likelihood of a mistake as the tape begins rolling. And actually, it's made it easier for me to time my fader move uh, because I can often open a fader before the tape even starts rolling. They're they're able, particularly when it comes to dialogue. To have the to, to edit edit the dialogue and they're they're doing a lot of this editing on the fly as well. But that dialogue will be edited in such a way that there's a few seconds of silence before the dialogue kicks in. So in in those kind of cases, I can I can leave the fader. I can hot track hot track the fader, uh, and they take care of that. In the older in, when I was starting up, you had to be very careful that you let the tape begin rolling before you open the fader because sometimes you'd have that ramp up as the as the tape began. Uh, 
but shows shows have compensated for that by becoming more complicated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, it used to be easier to follow that, but but uh, but shows have become more complicated. Any, anybody else? I, I really kind of like this. I was really kind of hoping that you guys would ask a lot of questions. Yeah, Kurt. Yeah. I think the, the rule of thumb is that if you're more greater than two frames out, which is 600 frames, so it's like about 30 milliseconds, that you can really start to get annoyed. Oh, you mean, you mean uh, with the audio and video yeah. uh, lip sync? Yes. Okay. J J I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's what you were talking about with sync, were you? Okay. What's related to it? Okay. Yeah, it's it's because really, uh, with lip sync, definitely uh, that's one of the things when you're when you're testing the transmission, uh, it's not uncommon for for actually at the end the the uh, station end for the, for them to want a lip sync test, and they'll actually sync that up with a with an audio delay usually. If for some reason, the video is usually delayed more than the audio. I guess the processing for the video signal is more is. More challenging. I don't. I don't know. So it, it, the video tends to get behind the audio. So it's an easy fix, right? Just to just throw a little delay circuit in there to, to uh, line it up. Okay. Anybody else for anything right now? All right. I'll move on. While we're on signal flow and routing, uh, I sat down one day and just tried to figure out what all the uh, the sources were that I, I was mixing. Why, how do we end up with with needing 128 channels of audio uh, to do a, a, a show from Fenway Park? And and I, I should I should step back in time a little bit because in in 1993 it was a big deal to have 48 channels on a show. So, so now now we're looking at 128 channels on a on a on a show to sometimes not be enough on a on a bigger show. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I put the, the field mics, crowd mics, camera mics, and house PA all in yellow uh, because that, that does become our NAT sound mix. I, we are, I already introduced that, uh, thanks to Eric's question. Uh, but So our, our NAT sound mix is comprised of those sources. Uh, I should explain that mix minus, uh, anybody, uh, uh, well, I'll just explain what it is. It's... Uh, the mix minus is generally coming down a phone line, believe it or not. Uh, a quick, for instance, would be from Nesson. <clears throat> you would send a mix to the Nesson remote production truck from the Nesson studio that contained the studio show uh, sources minus the production truck. So it's generally built on an aux bus, and now, so now, my guys in the production truck can have can be open in the studio desk back at Nesson, and they will hear the Nesson uh, broadcaster, the Nesson announcer from the studio, but not themselves in that mix because there's, there'd be a time delay. They can't they, they, they're they're because it's going to Nesson and then back over a phone line, so it's a way for them to hear the Nesson studio guy. And the Nesson studio guy to hear them, but them not to hear each other. So, so that's why that's what so that's what a mix minus is. Uh, that comes into the console and simply gets routed to my announcers. Listen, it doesn't get routed to the show. They're doing that part of the show back at the studio. Uh, tape playback we talked about. Sound effects would be uh, those swishes and everything else uh, from from these other. Uh, machines. Music playbacks usually done with a Digicart machine, which is uh, 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 made by Instant Replay. Uh, basically, you can assign hot buttons and, and uh, play music instantaneously. Uh, generally, uh, the music becomes a small part of my job. I sometimes have to edit uh, cuts that will time out exactly for commercial calls and this and that. But uh, So that's the deal there. The outputs. Uh, Surround mix, stereo mix, uh, mono mix, those are all full program mixes in different formats. Uh, 
generally I'm not mixing mono for broadcast anymore, but I'm taking the stereo feed and combining it for a mono mix for courtesy feeds. Uh, BC wants a courtesy feed when, when you're working here. Uh, the Boston Garden wants a courtesy feed. That's so the people who are watching the program at the venue hear, hear what's going on on the show. Uh, Nat Sound Mix, International Mix. Announcer pre-fade, I'll get into where that goes later. That's basically just a pre-fade uh, of the announcers. You usually build that on an aux bus. Play-by-play, -play, color, host, IFB mixes. Again, those are for the announcers to listen to the show. Uh, and they want to hear themselves and other elements of the show. It's called IFB because it's an interruptible mix, and I'll get into that in a little bit too. Basically, people in production have the ability to push a button and get in and inter interrupt their listen and give them, give them directions during the show. Uh, and then the camera operators get a mix if they're lucky. <laughs> uh, I, I tried to break this down and, and, and simplify it, I hope, uh, for uh, where different elements of my mix uh, go. And, and I don't think I'm un, unusual in this. I think this is pretty standard television, sports, rowdy. Uh, we, we talk to each other and, and talk, uh, uh, we meaning sports uh, mixers, and find out what each other's doing to try to, try to come up with newer and better ways to do things. Uh, I added the optional preamp because a lot of times, like I said, this microphone might be sitting a thousand or two thousand feet away from the production truck. Uh, by the time that cable runs through the uh, tie panel of the building and the audio mulch, which might be getting wet, and uh, it's it's liable to pick up some noise from some source. So it's really helpful to bring that mic signal up to line level right away if you can. Uh, from the console channel, that's, I usually group that to groups, either uh, subgroups three and four. If it's a stereo subgroup, group two in, in is a stereo subgroup. And then uh, <clears throat> it gets mixed with the other sources as for a show program on a post-fader basis. But on pre-fader, this mix of the NAT sounds needs to go, and that, that includes maybe not pre-fade from the channel, but it's a pre-fade of the subgroup with our, with our NAT sound mix on that. Uh, we'll go to VTR record. That's, that's in case they want to do a replay with NAT sounds. Best example there, I think, ever is the hockey goal that goes off the post and becomes a goal. You get that nice ping. Uh, and uh, the, the international transmission, like I talked about. And then also uh, radio, radio courtesy. The radio feeds uh, typically will take their NAT sound mix from the TV station or the TV that, uh, broadcast that's there because we have more, more personnel on site to, to really do a good job. So they'll just take a feed from us. Any, any questions about that? Oh, great. Uh, can I go with John first? What kind of compression do you use? Like how much and what kind of compressors do you use? As little as possible. Uh, no. Uh, Th that that it's it's actually you're going to get a different answer from a lot of different people on that. Uh, I used to use more compression on on a NAT sound mix bus than I do today, uh, but I also used to be mixing primarily for a satellite broadcast, where uh, an audio peak could be devastating to the entire satellite feed. Uh, Overmodulating the audio feed in a satellite broadcast actually can modulate the picture. Uh, so you, you actually need uh, to limit uh, when you're dealing with that. Now, now that I'm dealing with excellent peak meters, digital meters, and mixing primarily in digital, I've gone way easy on, on uh, that. I, I set my threshold right around uh, VU zero, and I use, say, like a two to one ratio, and that's just to kind of catch it when the crowd goes crazy. I, I want the full dynamics of the, uh, of the event. And that it really helps. Uh, again, I used to be mixing mostly in mono. Now I'm mixing in stereo and surround, and it, it, it really helps uh, the dynamics keep the spatial element if I don't squish it too bad.
it sounds like the audio cuts out. Yeah, right. Jeez, I don't know. I don't know what you're experiencing there. It's only Ness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to... It must be crazy every time. Uh, I've heard that. Uh, I, well, I know the guy who mixes the Nesson show, and I also know the guy who's the head of engineering at Nesson, and I'll, I'll talk to those guys about that. I haven't noticed that. Uh, I, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. You, you had a, you had a question too. Um, the uh, pre-fader mixes for HDR record. So is that a matrix mix? Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of times, uh, and it depends depends on how the board's set up. Uh, it there's there's a hundred ways to do it. There's a hundred different consoles. Uh, uh, one simple way I, I used to do it was on this compression loop, which in, in the analog world, if you think about it, I'm taking an insert out of the subgroup and I'm going into a, a compressor. And I'll take the output of the compressor into a DA. And then I'll bring one of the outputs of the DA back to the subgroup for mixing. And I'll take the other outputs of the DA to these sources. This, th this actually ends up going to the router and I'll get into the router in a little bit too. Uh, this goes to another set of DAs, and uh, the radio courtesy, again, could just be a DA out. That's, that's on the simplest. Uh, myself, I, what, what I really like to do, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Yamaha PM3000, which was the standard television sports board for 10 years for a while. Uh, I would actually take, like you said, I would leave this subgroup open and uh, just put the compression on the insert. I would use a matrix then to feed these sources. So I'd, so I could, I'd eat up a couple matrixes or, or one matrix with DAs. And then I'd take the, this is, this is gonna sound really strange, but I'd take the output of the subgroup and bring it back into two empty channels on the console. And the reason for that was then I could bring it up and down with a VCA. So I could bring my post fader up and down with a VCA, uh, which was on the same row of faders as my other sources. And so I could build a mix off the VCAs and, and I wouldn't have to reach up to the subgroups to bring that in and out. Uh, one, one of the interesting things in television sports is these major transitions that have to occur in your mix. And by that I mean when uh, when you're, you're, you're mixing the game, game action and then suddenly they want to replay an interview. Well, the interview takes place now. It's on tape, uh, for instance, in the locker room before the game. The, the space changes. If the picture changes from, the, from the, the stadium to the locker room, you want the sound to change as well. So now you have to bring down your announcers and your NAT sound mix and, and instantly bring up the tape feed. So make that big transition. And then to restore it, as soon as that tape's over, you have to again make a quick transition back and everything has to sound like it did when you left. Uh, so making adjustments at the fader level uh, is really difficult. So, so I like to build those major elements of my mix, if I can, on VCAs so that I can make those major transitions on and off and bring in, uh, bring in the uh, uh, net sound mix as, as, a whole, as a whole together. The same, same way you'd, you'd uh, subgroup a uh, drum kit in, in a live mix and bring, bring that in and out in balance. Only the transitions, I think, are a little bit bigger. And then uh, um, also the ETR records, are you, you, you've got different mixes for different recorders, so like if they're replaying, they replay something that was going on like in the, in the dugout, and, and there may be some dialogue in that, that would, would we be sending that like a mix of like just that more of that, that mic that's on the camera to that VTR mix, or, or is it just one VTR mix? The, the VTR, hopefully, when, when it's a full transition like that, the source that I'm going to is already built on the VTR. So that sound was, say, recorded during an interview segment before the game. 
So I don't have to add additional microphone ambience to that. The ambience that was recorded during that interview is already on the tape. So what is what is recorded during the day? Uh, then, then again, you're bringing up that ambience okay. as well, and, and you're stuck with it. It, it is what it is. Now, g generally, though, I mean, uh, it, that's, a, that's an interesting, you, you're making my mind go in a different direction, but we use uh, a, lot of, a lot more omnidirectional microphones than you think for announcers on the field. <coughs> See, is my next one the host position? Fred, Fred Ferris is on an omnidirectional mic right there, and you would think that being on the on the on the floor of Fenway Park, that I would that that we would choose a, a directional microphone to try to cancel out some of the crowd noise when we cut to that microphone. The reality is is that the announcers we're dealing with in a lot of cases are so horrible at mic position uh, that you need an omnidirectional mic, and 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 more more from the standpoint of proximity effect than from anything else. The Omni has no proximity effect, and if the announcer holds the mic very close to himself, but is six inches or 12 inches away from the, the guest that he's interviewing, uh, there, we have a big difference in frequency response between those two, more so even than the directionality. But now the other upside to that is that the mic picks up an omnidirectional mic in an environment like that picks up a really decent natural ambience as well. So if I just open that mic and close everything else, it's a mono source now, but it has a nice natural ambience. Uh, so so when, when, I, when I do go to that mic, it, 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 it matches. It, it doesn't have that sound of the rejection uh, that you get on the, on the crowd in that case. Yeah? If you do that move, how it it, it, that's that's a huge challenge on, on how that affects the, the stereo and surround. Uh, one, it's it's a, it's a it's tough balance. Uh, I try to have uh, sources uh, that are part of my surround mix that are <coughs> I separate at least in my head and also in the mix crowd mics from field effects mics, and so. Uh, crowd mics then become part of that surround base, and I try to not make that ambience change so that we, you can hold some of that ambience as you go to that. Sometimes it's impossible, and, and I'm not sure how, how to get around that, but if the crowd is going absolutely ballistic and you're trying to get to he hear an announcer on the field, uh, you sometimes have to close every other source but the microphone the announcer's on in order to even hear him above above that sound. And in that case, that, that would horribly affect your surround mix. I think in those moments, I've always made the decision of, well, we gotta know what he's saying. That's more important than the ambience changing. The ambience changes in television a lot already, like I said, from the tape machine transition to the field, uh, one location to another, that I think when we're looking at it, our, our brains will focus in and, and we'll lose, lose track a little bit of that surround loss. But uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. So basically, you move, your, your, your mic is on the stereo, so you don't put him on the surround, or you have that option, either you put him on the whole surround, or you just have to drop whatever's in the back and you leave him just on Right, and, and this depends a little bit on personal style and the people you're working with. Uh, some broadcasts want announcers in the center channel only, and that's, that's, that's it. Uh, some broadcasts, and, and actually the way I actually prefer to hear it myself, is they want that uh, uh, announcer sound to actually, uh, on some consoles they call it divergence and they want to bring that into the left, center, and right channels. And the, the great, the, the best uh, explanation I heard for that was I, I did uh, the Mets broadcast this past summer, and they were very specific about the percentage, actually, of announcer in the left, center, right. And they said, we want someone at home, if they totally screwed up the way their system's set up, to be able to hear the announcers in effect out of the left speaker 
or the center speaker, or the right speaker. My guess is that some executive at SNET, which was the network that was doing there, it was SNY, uh, had a surround system at home with the center channel in the living room and the left channel in the bedroom and the right channel in the kitchen. And he was trying to watch ball games and couldn't hear the announcers and freaked out. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so, so you, that's, that's another reason to do that. I feel like, uh, at least in the environments I've mixed in, it feels more natural to hear the announcers coming from in front of you, but not just out of that center channel. And I think that's open for, I think those are still questions that are being debated in the business about how to go about so, doing that. So can you just leave a little bit of the, the everybody, you know, just the sound on the background, just leave it on, and maybe put it lower a little. Yeah, that's 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 exactly what I do. Yeah, that's the strategy I've been using. Is is uh, you have I have crowd mics that are that are dedicated to the surround channel and are going to stay on all the time, and also crowd mics that are dedicated to the left right channel that I can that I can bring in and out a little bit, and try to bring that down a little bit and so I can bring that announcer forward and still maintain that that ambience. That's that's what that's what I've done. But a lot of times that's the, the crowd mics are, are the, the best place to put them, just in terms of cabling and safety, you know, so they won't get stolen, yeah. is right out of the announce booth. And some rejection behind them uh, oh, is a okay. good thing, so you, so you don't have the bleed of hearing the excited announcers in your crowd mics. And your pat mic would be a long, long shotgun? I prefer a long throw shotgun for a bat crack and for a, a, lot, of, uh, a, a lot of the, uh, of the sounds. What is the size of the peak of the backpack over the crowd ambience? Oh, wow. I don't know. You, you're looking for like a decibel level? Well, something like Is it a big thing or is it roughly the same thing? Or? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's really frequency specific. The sound of a, of a baseball bat hitting a ball, yeah. is, you know, the, well, that's in the old days they did. Yeah, in the old days they just banged some sticks together, right? When they were trying to create that. Uh, I, I cheat a little bit uh, in that uh, I, and this, this is my, just the way I EQ. I try to EQ a little bit of the room tone uh, out of all of my NAT sound mics that are pointed at the event. Uh, and that varies on the, from venue to venue on whether that's at, say, 200 hertz or whether it's at 350. Uh, basically, I'll sweep through my lower mids with a boost and find the most annoying room tone, <laughs> widen the cue out a little, and then just duck it by 3 dB or something. Yeah. And, and this, this has the effect of, of uh, taking the room, I, I call it taking the room out of the mic a little bit. And then for, for a sport like baseball bat cracks, I, I give a little two to three dB nudge, fairly narrow, uh, around 1.7, 1.8 K. And, when, and I do that also when I'm trying to get a mitt slap from a ball also. And that, it, it mixes itself then by bringing that sound, lifts that sound a little bit out, a little, little touch out of the mix. You gotta be careful, because you don't want, in your crowd sounds either. You have to you have to do it uh, very very subtly, but just a couple dB uh, really really helps because you, you know you're already you're already mixing with your hands too. Well, that's what I was curious about because the the, the baseball is hit the crowd goes round. You got a lot of dynamics going on at the same time. Hopefully, if I've set my mix up right, uh, it's a simple matter of grabbing that effects bus yeah. and just bringing it down just a touch. Uh, and uh, having compression that's that's doing its job as well. Which takes into the next one. Okay. Are you building sonic spaces on a lot of yellow submarine style mixing? I don't know what yellow submarine you know style. Song? I know the song, yeah. You're coming on the song, and that's one space, and then there's another space for the chorus. I think I'm a student of Dave Moulton's, and I think I've always sort of looked at a mix that way. Yeah. And I think that's a Dave Moulton thing. I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. I think I, and more A plus B, A minus B, maybe even in my thinking. So I'm from the high, 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 high stereo sorts of things. And yeah. they go crazy on that. They just want to have a 
standard compression for everything. And um, the DBX going to an actual level set compression is a big step forward in that world. Okay. And uh, um, when they did that, you know, he, that was because they were stuck. I, I guess I guess so. I, I wasn't doing it consciously though, I don't think, except in terms of trying to balance wide space yeah, and, a, and narrow course. space. But but looking at it looking at a mix in terms of of, of depth as well. Uh, with 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 hopefully announcers here and game here, yeah. but game action that's on a tight shot here as well. Uh, so th that's kind of the way I, that's just, that's just the way I look at it. Now, when it comes to compression, you just made, triggered another thought on mine. I think it's crazy that in sports television, I'm now mixing for a greater dynamic range than I did 15 years ago and trying to use every inch of it because I think it builds a more exciting mix. And yet, in the music world, the exact opposite has happened. Yeah. <laughs> they took the exact opposite approach to uh, digital dynamic range. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's tragic. But anyway. Well, so that's that. what the figures demand. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got more time for one more? Oh, yeah. Quick. Yeah, no, this is good. If I don't get to these, that's fine. Why are all those people? Because that would be a nightmare. <laughs> uh, frequency coordination at a uh, at a professional event, especially in downtown Boston, is a nightmare. It's a bad already. So, sometimes it's hard enough to find uh, one working wireless mic channel and one working wireless IFB channel. Uh, and anytime you get into more than say three wireless sources. I like the client to hire a RF specialist to come in with a scanner and their own equipment frequency agile. And guys who can hold people are cheaper too. Yeah, oh def definitely. It's and the equipment's cheaper too. And I think more reliable okay. in the long run. I think there's more dropouts and et cetera with that. Now the, the, now I think a more uh, uh, another question built off that same idea is why are we still running copper? To, to these remote locations. Well, that's, that what, was, I'm looking at the same thing, my God, this is why, change. Why isn't there more fiber? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's coming, but uh, the business is slow to change. The buildings are all wired with copper. Yeah. The trucks are all wired uh, for external connection with copper. Uh, copper is still universal. You could fix it with a screwdriver. So e exactly, yeah. exactly, and, and w one, the, Everyone knows how to fix a copper wire. Yeah. Uh, not everybody knows that you can't turn around pin two and three on one end, but that's another <coughs> that's another another problem as well. Okay, so that was that. Uh, the, yeah. As far as the catcher's mitt, is there a dedicated mic to that, or is that getting picked up from the bat? That's getting picked up from the bat crack. It is. Yeah. Hang. On, you know what? I'm going to jump ahead. Forget the announcers. Forget this. No, you guys are asking a lot of great questions about uh, NAT sound miking. And I, I built that towards the end of my PowerPoint, but uh, I might as well get to that and, and we can address these, these uh, questions. And how do you sound check? Like, do you have them go out there and just play ball? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dustin Pedroia, Kevin Euclid, I need you guys here. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I, no, I love that question because when I, was, when I was new, it was really, really hard because there are no sound checks. Yeah. Because the arena's empty when you're set up. Even when they come out for warm-ups, the arena's empty 
and you can get an idea of what things are going to sound like when the players are on the ice or in the field, sort of. But at Fenway Park, the PA is going while the guys are warming up. Uh, so, you, so you don't get a sound check. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, it comes with a little bit of experience to figure out how to blend the elements of the, the, the Nat sound mix with your announcers. You don't always get an announcer sound check. This is, this is really crazy. Announcers will often show up and just put on their headset and you gotta be go. They're, right, they're go mode. And, and so you have to make sure that your A2s have, uh, that you've worked with your A2s and set your gains at least. You can always make subtle EQ adjustments and compression adjustments on the fly. Uh, Gain is gain is a tougher a tougher nut, and you want to be pretty close. You got to be in the ballpark, and that's with your NAT sound sources and your and your announcer sources. So I'll have I'll have an A2 check a microphone at standard conversation level, but then I'll also say, hey, give me yell into the microphone for me, uh, so I can set uh, my gains that way. I and I do the same thing with some of the NAT sound mics. Particularly, uh, one, one of the sources that I get uh, are microphones that run through the camera electronics. We don't have to run individual mic cable to every camera that we want to put a microphone on. Uh, the cameras have electronics for the microphone in them, and that'll run through the camera. But the uh, preamp in the camera is prone, especially older cameras, has to be adjusted at the camera and uh, is prone to distort hard, clip hard if you go over. So if you're at a sporting event two hours before and you see some guy walk up to a camera and, and go, hey, Rick, do you hear me? That's the reason. Uh, be, uh, and this, again, comes depending on the event. I know that in, uh, for instance, basketball or college football, at some point, they're going to point the mic on that camera at the band, and the director's going to say, hey, I want to hear the band. Open that mic up. And uh, if you haven't checked it for a kick drum trombone level, uh, you're liable to have, you're out liable to be clipping, and I, I hate clipping. I, I do. I just hate it. I can't stand it. Uh, so, yeah, that's a great question, because that, I haven't thought about it in a long time. That used to drive me nuts, not getting the sound check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you happen to know what happened to Howard Dean in the uh, Iowa caucuses <laughs> several years ago? Was that the one where he yelled? He yeah. didn't hear himself in his inner ear monitor. Is that right? And he yelled to test out to see if he could hear himself. Well, that's a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think what happened to him was, was he made a classic political blunder. Uh, yeah, no, I, I guess he couldn't hear himself in his, in his, his that's, in, that's in the ear monitor and yelled to check it. And unfortunately, somebody captured that and recorded that. I, I thought so, too. I, I didn't, I don't know the story, really. I thought that they, somebody had turned down the, uh, whatever you call it, the, the ambient microphone so that he was trying to yell above the crowd. Okay. So In either case, it was tragic if you're a liberal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kyle. Uh, um, on the subject of you know, um, sound checking announcers and stuff like that, what do you do for compression for announcers? Say, you know, at a Bruins game, you know, <clears throat> Milan Lucic scores a goal, Jack Edwards is he's announcing, he gets excited, he starts yelling, he raises his voice, what do you do? How do you prepare for that? I mean, do you have I, I do, and, and I, the, the great part about these questions about compression is if you lined up five TV sports mixers in a row and asked them what they did, you'd get five different answers, uh, chances are. Uh, I put, uh, I compress, the, I, they come through one bus, the right. announcers, and I do put compression on that bus, uh, and if I think of that as the hard compression, that's, that's, a high threshold 
three to one to four to one compression for that moment that you're talking about. Uh, I found myself that I, I like to have channel compression as well on the sports caster headset microphones. And the reason for that is that if one guy gets excited and animated and he's triggering the threshold of the compressor, compressor the other guy's being compressed. Uh, so I like to have individual also. And what I do there is maybe more uh, traditional of what, how you'd treat a vocalist in the studio, which is a, a lower threshold, say 10 to 1 threshold, with, with very light ratios, uh, 1 to 7, uh, 1 to 7 to 1 or 2 to 1 compression, uh, so that uh, in a quiet voice, maybe normal announcing, they're not triggering that threshold. But if they get animated, they begin to trigger that, and that gets triggered before the, the, the catch. I, I, think, I think it's a similar strategy that you would use on a very dynamic singer in the studio. I, I'm assuming that that's, that, that's, that's, that's a technique I, I used uh, live when I had a dynamic uh, singer. So. If, if I have um, the, the, the likelihood of having the same truck with the same console and the same patch field uh, for, for the next time I'm on that show is, is unlikely. But when possible, I do save my last settings on a particular digital board uh, if the truck will allow me to do that. Most of them are carrying around uh, banks of saved shows if nothing else, to give me a starting point when I'm on that truck again. And I try to build the show uh, as flexible as possible so that it's easily easily changeable if I'm doing a surround show, stereo show, if I need to build, build both or, or stuff. So yeah, when possible, I save things. But uh, like I said, it's uh, unfortunately, uh, one, one year I tried to count it up and I, I lost track after I got to 50 different trucks with 50 different boards and, you know, or 50 trucks with 30 different boards, which, which was also 50 different patch fields. And sometimes finding what you need in the patch field and remembering the patch field is more important than remembering the, the, the board. I, I spend more of my time hunting for sources in a jack field than I, than I do uh, trying, to, trying to figure out a new console. Or con consoles are after a while, unless you're seeing a new digital board for the first time. The console becomes less challenging than the patch field, which is really bizarre. Uh, anything else right now? This is great. Thank you for asking, for asking so many great questions. Uh, to, to sports miking, I, I jumped ahead. I, I jumped past. Now you're asking questions earlier, but that's okay. Uh, I jumped ahead to sports miking. Basically, there's a few simple guidelines to sports miking, and that way. It's easy to adapt to a new show. Uh, not this past summer, but the summer before, I ended up doing sound for a paintball tournament. I didn't know how a paintball tournament even went. But, so, so, but if you follow these, these basic rules and you have some idea of some of the miking strategies you've used in the past, you can adapt uh, when, when you've got to go. Uh, like I said, we're second fiddle to cameras. We're second fiddle to the, the visual aspect of the production. So you want to be as invisible as possible. Now, I look for mics on, on sports shows now when I watch them. Uh, you can't help that, right? Uh, it is, it's, it's, it's what you do. Uh, <clears throat> but besides general pickup, it's really important to be near exciting game action. And, and obviously, uh, the goal mics in hockey are an important thing to, to mic. The hoop in a basketball game is an important thing to mic. Uh, and, then, and then some extras maybe a little outside the box if you know the sport a little well. Corner mics in soccer don't get used except on a corner kick. 
But when the camera cuts in close, it's a lot of, that's alliteration. When the camera cuts in close on a corner kick, <laughs> you want to hear that. You really want to hear that kick, uh, so you have to have a mic on it. Uh, the first base pickoff, you might not think about it, but all game long, one of the toughest things for me to do mixing baseball is remembering when there's a guy on first to have my finger on that fader and have it up just a little bit so it's not too obvious when I ramp it up and the pitcher makes a throw over to first base. And you might not notice it if it's not there, but it sure helps you to, to get what's going on. If you hear the, if you hear the, the mic slap in the glove, the, the ball slap in the glove. Uh, bullpen mics in, uh, in uh, baseball are also important because they'll cut to that guy warming up. And, if it, and you don't want it to be silent back there. You want to hear the ball slap the catcher's mitt and warm up. Uh, some of these uh, I, I, I put on here, too, because uh, a big challenge sometimes is working with the sport and officials uh, to put mics in places that are not just invisible to fans and cameras, but also to the coaches and referees in the sport. Uh, Hockey blue lines, we like to put a mic, uh, mics near the blue lines in hockey so we have some fill between the goals as the skaters skate back and forth. Also, if you're a hockey fan, you know that a lot of the action in hockey, especially in the NHL, revolves around whether a team can, can trap the puck in that blue line zone. So there's a lot of action at the blue lines, and, and we want to put a mic there. And we've had to move them one direction or the other depending at different times in the NHL, depending on what officials thought that that microphone might either be, become part of the play somehow or be seen in a way that was, it was inappropriate. Uh, yeah? Are you familiar with the mic setups for tennis matches? Yep. Can I? Yeah. Um, uh, can I get to that in a little bit? Is that all right? Can I lead to it? i got to lead. Uh, <clears throat> baseball parabs by that, the parabolic dishes uh, are often preferred as bat crack mics over the shotgun uh, to uh, catch the sound of the, uh, of the batter. Myself, I like the sound quality of a shotgun mic better. Uh, parab parabolic reflectors are inherently uh, mid-rangey, uh, but in some cases, they get you better focused on, on the action. But those can be a problem, too, at Fenway Park because they're big and ugly and they look like satellite dishes. And uh, the fans who paid the big bucks uh, don't want to have to look through that to see what Jason Veritek's doing. Uh, football parabs, I'll get to that, too. That's always a battle. And in basketball, we actually got to a point at the, the Boston Garden where the team said, no, you can't have that mic there. No, you can't have that. We became very limited in terms of our miking ability down there because the coach didn't want ever on TV to hear the instructions he was yelling at the team, and which is very funny because we were even hearing that from mics on the basket. <laughs> uh, so there's not much you can do there. Obviously, he's trying to be heard by players on the court, uh, but it's, it's, always, it's always a battle. It's, it's, it, it, it actually makes it interesting. Uh, I guess I talked about this. When, when, a cam when a, uh, the camera is going to zoom into a location, you want that sound, and I think we talked about that. I want that sound to come to you. As the camera zooms in, I want that sound to come forward. And, and that means if the camera in hockey is wide and then zooms in on a location uh, behind the goal or whatever. I want, that, I want the sound from there to just come and take over, take over the NAT sound mix. I, I want to give the viewer the, uh, the, uh, the same kind of perspective if I can. And that involves uh, placing mics close to the action. And in, in, uh, net mics and lacrosse are always done uh, uh, wirelessly, for instance. Ref mics in football, you're all familiar with that. That, again, is a wireless mic where the ref pushes a button and talks to everybody. So. Are you getting instructions on your headset if You, you, you learn uh, some uh, 
camera one in America is a wide shot. Camera two is a zoomed in look. Camera three and four are handhelds that are gonna give you downstairs looks. In the audio room, I try to have a variety of those cameras also so I can preview. So if they're getting ready to go to one, I can be ready to go to that. Some of it's feel and sometimes you miss. It's, it's not perfect. Uh, uh, just put some examples of some of the shotgun mics we use. Uh, it's one of the things that makes TV sports unique. Uh, if you're not in TV, you probably don't use shotgun mics yeah, or, or, or maybe the theater. Uh, I started with soccer miking because I got great pictures from an A2 uh, from Gillette Stadium. In, it, you can see that we try to keep things pretty balanced around the field so I can keep the coverage balanced no matter where players are. Obviously, I'm going to have dead zones in the coverage right in the middle. Uh, and, and unfortunately, when they get close to the center view, I'm going to have an imbalance again. They're, I might be on a wide shot, but they're close to my mic. And I try to pay attention to that, but it's not always possible. And sometimes you're on a wide shot and you still get sounds like they're right in front of you. But I, I just saw Brian took some great pictures. This and this is a uh, goal mic. Uh, it's uh, probably an 816 or an MKH 70 behind the uh, net at uh, Gillette Stadium. And this is a corner mic. Now, uh, good good question here would be what happens if the ball comes and knocks over the microphone? <laughs> and the answer is is that you send your A2 out to set the microphone back up again when they're at the other end of the field. Yeah. What about leather too? Oh, yeah, you can see here on the end of this mic a little bit that there's some plastic wrap hanging off there. Uh, what, in, a, in a drizzle, I've, I've at times left key microphones open to the weather with just a windscreen and then replaced windscreens on the hour brought them back and dried them. Because uh, you know as soon as you put plastic over the microphone, you change the directional characteristics. Uh, and you're closing up all, the, all those excellent rear ports. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the cost of the microphone usually wins out. And in a downpour, you got to do what you can to protect the microphone, and that, and that usually means plastic wrap. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not enough trucks travel with uh, the Zeppelin and then the kitty cat, the squirrel fuzzy that goes over the Zeppelin, uh, because those are actually very weatherproof. Uh, and they also allow for the rejection ports to stay open. But uh, mo mostly we grin and bear it with, uh, with, with a plastic over the mic. If you put plastic over the mic, do you hear the rain in the plastic? In some cases, yeah. yeah. Then again, in some cases, that's the desire to, right? You, you, you're seeing rain, you hear rain, and as a listen, as a viewer or listener, it, it makes sense. So, uh, this is this uh, crowd mics here from the announce booth. So, uh, it, this is the table that the announcers would be sitting at. So, uh, it's it's nice to have the rejection. That's again, the shotgun mics there as opposed to an Omni or a cardioid. Uh, Mark Wilcox. Uh, our center uh, microphone in soccer, uh, typically in soccer we get a uh, camera that's close to the action and center and is going to point, it's, it's a big microphone pointer is what I call that device. <laughs> and, and we have a big microphone pointer operator uh, who, think, who, who thinks his job is to, uh, to get pictures for the show, but it's actually to <laughs> collect sound for us. <clears throat> Uh, hopefully Mark's using the backwards gaff tape technique here, which I'm sure he is because he's an experienced A2. Uh, a lot of times you'll attach a microphone to a camera using uh, bungee cords. Uh, in a pinch, gaff tape fixes everything, but you want to put it on backwards and then take that backwards tape down to the camera so that you don't tear your uh, windscreen to shreds. There, there's an example at Harvard with a, with a bungee cord. A goal mic at Harvard. That's a little close for my taste, but, but uh, you, you want to get as close to the action as you can. Uh, it's a very directional mic, though, so you're going you're gonna to miss out on 
on some of the coverage, you know, end to end of the of the of the, the, the net. And I want to hear that when I'm mixing. So, and this is my favorite picture of the whole PowerPoint. So I'm yeah. glad we got to this. Uh, in a pinch, you just got to make it work. And this is this is a case where there weren't enough mic stands on the truck uh, to go around, so a, uh, a roll of gaff tape did the job of a mic stand. Now, um, myself, and this is, I, if possible in soccer, I like to actually have my microphones on a stand about, uh, about chest high instead of on the ground. And it has to do with the uh, uh, frequency that you're trying to pick up uh, in, in phase in the microphone. And obviously, uh, you're going to have that uh, reflection on the ground in front of the microphone that's going to combine with the direct source from the mic. And at, at the short wavelengths, it's going to be in the upper mids. Uh, if it's a little higher, that, that frequency that's going to cause that cancellation is going to be in lo lower mids. And so you're going to get actually better pickup of the uh, intelligible parts, the important parts of, of, the, of the sound you're picking up. Uh, I, do, I do a lot of box. I did a lot of boxing for uh, uh, ESPN and HBO. Uh, the fish pole is actually uh, a, a, a pole-mounted uh, operated microphone. And the fish pole operators uh, are actually following the action. Boxing's great. You have a lot of microphone in a very small area. So you can pick up a lot although the ambience is always challenging in boxing. The big challenge in boxing is making sure you only open up one microphone at a time uh, so you don't get uh, time delay cancellations between microphones. Obviously, these guys are too close together. If you open these guys both up at the same time, you're picking up the same source, and you might get some comb filtering. Uh, you also you can usually get away with having the overhead open and as, uh, as ambience as long as you're not trying to get too deep into the action straight overhead. Uh, and in that case, you want to bring down your other mics as well. So uh, the, the big challenge mixing some of these uh, event, events is, is not having too many mics open at once. And I couldn't help myself. I didn't have any good pictures of boxing, so I grabbed this one. Uh, so the fish pole operators would be off at the side, and they'd be, uh, they'd be following the action. <laughs> Their big job on a, on a boxing event, and, and I do usually get an RF microphone on a trainer in the corner, but in boxing, it's a big deal to hear what the trainer says to the, to the fighter uh, between uh, rounds. And so the fish pole operator's biggest job is actually to get in, uh, into the corner in between rounds and listen in on what's going on. And, and you've got to hear that at times. Uh, basic baseball, this is uh, what we do at Fenway. This is uh, typically done with shotguns. I think in the outfield now, we have a shotgun hidden in the green monster, a shotgun pointed down at center field, and I think maybe a PCC, and I'll get into PCCs, uh, on, the, on, the, on the floor or on the, on the ground in front of the wall in right field. Maybe it's a lavalier to tucked into the, uh, tucked in between one of the pads. But then shotguns on the, on the pick mics, we put shotguns on the dugout cameras so that when we go, you go to look at a team or a player during a celebration, you can bring that up. Uh, stereo mics from the announce booth. Uh, I wanted to show at, <clears throat> at a different level, uh, you end up with a lot more mics and a lot more A2s. Uh, I've seen, well, this is, you're supposed to see a line here because that would be a foul pole mic. So we've mic'd, we've mic'd the foul poles. I've seen wireless transmitters and wireless mics buried in the grass for baseball. Uh, Fox and ESPN almost routinely now put wireless mics in each of the bases, which is why sometimes when a guy slides into second base, you can hear it so intensely. Now, I know that like me, you guys are done watching baseball for the season, but if you do happen to watch a game of like, I don't know, the Phillies and Dodgers or something, something that doesn't break your heart, uh, it, listen, listen for a guy sliding in the second base uh, during a national playoff broadcast. They're gonna, they actually have, they actually have mics, wireless mics in the back. Personally, I'm not big on the sound, but like a lot of things in the business, I like it because it means more people are working. So, uh, 
that's, that's always fun. And, and we've added a center uh, bat crack mic, too, and the center mic is typically pointed back at the pitcher's mouth, and that's to pick up, believe it or not, the throw from the catcher back to the pitcher, because that's, so, that's important, too. When I was mixing in mono, I used to use one for left-handed batters and one for right-handed batters. Uh, now in stereo, I actually make those part of the stereo mix. And it, it's, it, it, yeah, I pan them hard left and right. And, and uh, for me, anyway, it's really cool because when the umpire turns in one direction and yells strike, I hear it from that, you know, I hear it from that channel. Uh, it's, by itself, it's too wide. There's no real good imaging coming from it. But once you add the announcer mics and everything else to your mix, I kind of like that. Some, sometimes it's it's not a it's not a perfect stereo balance, but it's a it's a uh, it adds some some depth to the mix, some left right depth to the mix. Yeah. Is it your job when uh, like an athlete swears and you hear it for real time? Do you cut it out? Because sometimes it gets cut out, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I always prided myself that I think I got a good, mm, I can't say it, they're taping me, but I got good swears from hockey players in almost every game I ever, uh, <laughs> I ever mix. Uh, it's live television and there's no delay for cutting out, uh, there's no FCC delay on that. The rule is, is that if there's an argument going on and there might be swearing, to, to back down on that mic and bring up ambience from somewhere else. Uh, but in regular action, if you get the occasional swear, I always kind of considered that like I was doing my job right. Uh, cause in hockey especially, you hear a lot of that. Th this is, uh, my friend Bob Qua sent me this. He, he works routinely on the uh, Fox uh, World Series baseball show. He had, he had scanned this. This is a scrap. Uh, this is, this is a miking layout for the 2000 World Series. Uh, and basically, if you look around, <clears throat> you have an operated parab. This is, this is just around the outfield. These are all sources, and the, uh, the goal was to have everything covered. Obviously, the guy mixing the production had a submixer to deal with all these sources. Uh, and they kept a lot of people working, because these parabs, everywhere it says parabs, it means you have an operator there also. So now the operator's not making a ton of money, but it is a job for a, for a young person. Uh, so. And then uh, uh, some gratuitous shots of Fenway Park. Uh, Fred Ferris is hanging a uh, bat crack mic here. This is where they go at Fenway on a routine basis. Uh, there's a bat crack mic sitting up there. Now, uh, I'm hoping maybe one of you guys can help me on. Fenway Park is a is from the facade of Fenway Park acts like a big RF reflector. The Prudential Tower and the Hancock Building are looking right into that. The RF is so bad, we often pick up a radio station in an open microphone. This is not an RF receiver, but I'm getting that much RF interference. Now the solution for as many years as I've been working there, is to add a little courtesy coil at the microphone end, and it gets rid of it. And I'm not sure if, if that somehow creates a cancellation or, or if it's just changing the length of that wire going to that, that mic that, that causes it. Is that, is that yeah, it's like twisting the pairs in the microphone. It's That's making sure it picks it up. And that's what I was wondering. Is it is it uh, is it like using a figure eight loop on um, in power? So you're you're creating opposite electromagnetic charge. You're not building up one electromagnetic force. Are you creating a cancellation there? You recognize the source. What's that? You recognize the RF source. It's you recognize the RF. Would you know its frequency? No, we don't. We we don't know the frequency. That, okay, that that's that's been my guess all these years, but I was hoping that you know one of you guys would would go. Oh yeah, yeah, that's because I did that. Okay, so you guys are oh, just the same as me. I know the good thing is is I know it works, <laughs> and I like stuff that works. I don't always have to uh, understand it. Does, does it only work if that loop actually touches back onto the cable? <clears throat> a 
That's a good question. I don't so, so what happens is on fields and waves, it may not be RF that you're actually getting, but you're getting a signal, it's a parasitic inductance in that cable. And the inductance actually terminates that cable where those two cross at a 90 degree angle right there on that loop. Here. Right here? And all of your picture, that changes the length of that transmission line. So the wavelength of that antenna right there is now shorter and it can't pick up the okay. That's that that was that was my that was my guess and you 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 phrased it better than I could have. That's great. I'm gonna. So the I'm important thing there is the loop and that it's touching in a close field effect and that's approximately a 90 degree angle right there where it calls. Okay. So that you think the 90 degree angle is part of the key there is in that for the. So did you pull the mic cable and, and it stretched it out a little bit and suddenly your new radio came yeah. through it? Yeah. And then you put the loop back in and it goes away. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> And the preamplifier is in the microphone. There's uh, well, it's it's a condenser mic, so whatever 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 is it's just a just a simple condenser mic. Uh, and now that's a good question. I'm I'm, free, I'm not I don't remember if it occurs if the if the line's unterminated or not. Could be in the mic. That that's this is what I I don't remember. That's 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 what I'm thinking. I. I, uh, I don't I don't know that answer. That's, I, I'm thinking of that question right now as well. We could take this further. What about the diameter? Of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I added these slides because uh, not everybody gets in the Green Monster, and uh, A2s at Fenway get in there all the time. Uh, it smells like urine. <laughs> uh, there's no bathroom in there. The guys are in there for long games. Uh, we originally stuck a lavalier back here on the wall uh, to get the sound of the, ba of the ball hitting off there, uh, off the wall. And one day out of necessity, didn't have lavaliers, and just said, hey, do what you just stick a shotgun mic and point it at the wall from inside here. And believe it or not, that's the best sound we get. Anything that hits the metal on here goes bang! Like it sounds like the ball's coming off of an old metal shed. And uh, that's, that's, the sound, that's the sound we want to hear. Hockey miking, uh, this, is, this is maybe a quick tutorial in PCCs. I don't know, how, how many of you guys have worked with PCCs before? A couple, couple of you guys, theater? Theater work? Yeah. It, it's designed as a theater mic. Basically, Oh, the arms and legs of this guy are gone. Uh, basically, <laughs> that's a person, not a lollipop. And he's speaking into the PCC. Uh, now, on the PCC, as some of you guys know, fr from the side, and, and maybe if I back up, uh, what I'm looking at is a side view, so down, down one of the sides here. So this would be the front and then the, the back, uh, and this sits flat on the ground in, in a stage application. So we have an area, so it, it acts like a PZM, only there's, instead of being a hemispherical pickup, it's a semi-hemispherical pickup. So it's going to pick up in a sphere on this side, it's going to reject, reject in a sphere on this side. Design, designed as a theater mic. Uh, guy, we used to use shotgun mics and lavaliers on a hockey, on a hockey arena. And a uh, guy who was just starting at A2 in the, in the mid-90s, uh, who has also, also done a lot of live sound work, walked in and said, geez, you guys should use a PCC because the pickup area picks up inside the glass. The rejection area rejects the crowd on the other side. If you, and if you look at the mic's pickup angle also, front to back, it's an extremely wide pickup area. It's almost a 180-degree pickup from, on the front side and then 180-degree rejection on the other side. So from, from behind the goal, I can pick up sounds in each corner on the sides of the glass and very deep in, into the ice as well. Yeah, John. What, what is the uh, PAC standard? Is that just the P is for pressure? Or? Pressure something cardioid. Coherent? What is it? Coherent cardioid. Pre yeah, pressure coherent cardioid, something like that, yeah. Do that, okay. 
I think it would be great in some in some cases on a hypercardioid. Uh, myself, in hockey, I, I like the the width of the pickup, and and the and the, the rejection pattern is perfect for hockey as it is. And there's a there's a picture of of the back of a PCC uh, hung on the glass at the fleet center. And if you uh, now this isn't my pr my preferred positioning on these, by the way. There's lots of argument with this too. But I prefer the, uh, the, the end of the mic to be right at the top of the glass uh, so that that way any sound hitting the glass is in the pickup area. Sounds beyond the glass is in the rejection area. I feel like this adds a little bit of rejection from some of the sounds that might be coming from the ice. That's me. You got, again, yes, five, five uh, TV sports mixers, and they're going to they're gonna tell you five different things. Do you use the filter? Is it a flash or? I, I like it in boost mode, actually. Uh, at least in hockey, if I'm going to use it outdoors where there might be some wind noise, I'll use a windscreen and use it in flat mode. I, I don't know about you. I find the flat mode on that guy is almost like if it's got a high-pass filter on it. You always cut out the lows? You always cut out the lows? Yeah, I use it for For what? For footwork. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, I, I'm trying to get uh, in hockey... Uh, I think some of the excitement from the skate noise for when they cut into the skate is actually in the low mids. Uh, and uh, also, the I like the mic particularly for its intelligibility. Like, like the PZM, uh, you get uh, a very coherent, intelligible sound from a distance. And I, and I, like, I like to hear the guy swear. Yeah, Brian. Is anything else to like capture reporter noise at all, or you just rely all on the PCCs? I, re I rely on those PCCs. It's it's, it's amazing the uh, the pickup. They're they're great for that. So it's pretty much all PCCs in hockey. Yeah. Headset, it, uh, headset mics and whatnot, and monitors. Yeah. Well, well, headset mics for talent, and then and then PCCs for game action, and then shotgun mics for crowd. And uh, I like using uh, six. Uh, PCCs, I, I like using this, if I have the same microphone everywhere, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, I like to open up one microphone at a time to avoid uh, phase problems and timing problems. And this way, every microphone I open has the same ambience to it. So my, I can, if I'm careful about how I'm opening and closing the next mic, uh, I can match the ambience from one, from one mic to the other mic. Uh, no, but uh, it, can, it, it is done sometimes. Uh, I think as you get uh, a bigger budget, more setup time, et cetera, et cetera, that would be a place you might add, uh, particularly just to get that opening face off, maybe a, a long throw center shotgun to get those, those opening face offs. The uh, Canadians like uh, hang, hang shotguns from the rafters for their hockey. I've actually seen uh, from the stadium some mic singers from the, the you know, scoreboard in the center. Mm -hmm. Some some of those are for TV, but more likely those are for uh, something else that's going on in the in the arena. Uh, it's uh, it adds a lot of setup time and cable uh, to get something from the catwalk, and sometimes it involves adding union personnel. I was gonna sometimes did, are some of those mics like permanent installations of the places where you, they leave the I, mics there I, and I, you just I, patch right into them somewhere. I think so. Yeah, but so uh, have to, like set up mics every time. Yeah, but uh, that's that's not the case in the in the local pro pro venues or high, or college venues. I, I have seen that um, some of the the casinos uh, with when you're doing boxing there, when they have their own AV crew already, uh, have more permanent install mics, over overhead mics for their uh, boxing setup, uh, <clears throat> neutral corner mics that are set up because they actually use those in the PA there to enhance the experience for the folks in the, uh, in the crowd, which I understand it's not so great, though, for us on television because they have to keep that, that level really, really low or we hear it as an echo. You, you asked me earlier about tennis, so I'm finally there. So I want to take care of your questions. What were your questions? I was just curious about the setup. Uh, I, I'm, 
I made sure I said my way on the tennis setup. Uh, I think I'm the only human being on the planet who relies so heavily on PZMs and PCCs for tennis. But to me, it's the perfect venue for it because when the action of the sport is going on, the crowd is quiet. So you can actually have PZMs opened and they'll actually pick up actual game excitement and they'll pick it up phase coherent as well and very intelligible if they're placed on a good flat surface. And then when the crowd erupts at the end of the point, you hear a crowd, which is what you want to hear. Uh, typically, your camera position for tennis is actually, your main camera position is actually looking down this way. So what I'll do is I'll pan these guys left and right uh, <clears throat> and then rely heavily on a very directional shotgun mic on the low boy, uh, which is a, which is a sit, the cameraman actually sits and it's kind of on wheels and they can wheel themselves around. And these mics point always right at the player. So I got an 816 pointed right at the player. So, so this becomes part of my ambient mix. And then I'll hear it if the neck gets hit. You'll hear the neck getting hit. You'll also hear footfalls if they approach the net. But my service and my returns will, will be picked up in the shotgun. And I'll mix these guys to the mon to mono, or, you know, or in between the left, right. Uh, Again, trying to create some sense of space. If you put those PCMs to the left and right, if you're, say, so you have the top on your left, the bottom one here on your right, what if it switches to the backcourt camera for the other person? Now your left is your right, and vice versa. The game action is actually always shot from one perspective. Uh -oh. They're pretty good about, and this is, this is pretty standard TV technique, which is a reverse angle becomes a big deal. Uh, because you don't want to throw the perspective off on your viewer. So typically if they cut to a camera over on this side, it'll actually be a handheld and it'll be pointed right at the player. So in that case, you're not changing this perspective at all. Uh, it's a setup shot for, for a player warming up, getting ready for a shot. Yeah, it's a good question though, Eric. Yeah. Um, since the tennis is so quiet during gameplay, um, why would you Oh, oh, because because you you do you do catch it actually, with 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 the PZM actually, with the PZM and your crowd mics. Because I, I I also I didn't did I mention oh yeah I did, also I'd set up crowd mics, that would stay open be part of the the ambience all the time. So I actually think that the PZM picks that up better and more naturally than uh, what I see a lot and what I see a lot is I see shotguns from the four, four corners pointed at the action. And, and uh, that, that seems to me to be, to be a, a little bit sloppy, actually. You're picking up small zones of space from each microphone, and you have to work them all the time, rather than having a nice ambience all the time and not, not having to worry about it so much. But like I said, that's why I called it my way. Because you're going to hear a lot of arguments about that from, from TV uh, sports guys. Yeah, Kyle. Have you ever, or have you ever talked to anybody who's won golf, and how did they do that? <clears throat> golf is the uh, devil. <laughs> 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 golf is is purgatory and hell. It is absolutely insane. Uh, I did one golf show many years ago as an A2. Uh, in golf. You have a submixer who is literally submixing uh, the NAT sounds from every hole. So you have a, a, tee, a tee off mic, a mid midstream mic, down the fairway mic, and then you have mic, a mic at the tee. And the submixer is trying to follow this at every hole there's something going on and there's coverage. And switching back and forth between various. And he's gotta have he's gotta have these because what's going on is these are being recorded to different tape tape players so that the main mixer 
And now the main mixer also has all these sources, and he's following the actual camera cut of the show. But they often in golf go to a replay of what just happened, say, back at hole 13. And on that, main mix show guy has to grab the tape machine that was recording what just happened by the submixer. So now you have to go get to those that playback while the submixer is now getting what's going on now at hole 13 and 14 and 15 and whatever else they're recording. It is a complicated mess. It's awesome. Uh, golf, golf takes about a week to set up at every venue. Uh, the, the course is so big that uh, now they're using more fiber now, but back in the day, and I think still, they were using actual twisted pair phone wire, like 25 pair phone wire to remote uh, uh, holes and sending, you can, believe it or not, send line level audio uh, down a twisted pair if you bring it up to line, if you bring the mics up to line level from the course and you can fire the communications boxes uh, that are at that area if you know which pins your voltage is coming on, it needs to be on to, to, to wire those boxes. So uh, a lot of guys who are golf guys carry around the little uh, phone phone punches and uh, deal with a lot of, deal with a lot of twisted pair. So it's 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 really really cool and really like I said it's really hell. Uh, I haven't done much golf on purpose. <laughs> it's like skiing. I did one ski show early on and uh, I had to run a couple thousand feet of cable up side of a mountain. That's not fun. <laughs> and, and besides that, you know, you're away from home for a few days and stuff. If you love skiing, it's great because you usually get a pass and you ski all day. You know, if you're, if you're a good skier, you can ski to your next location, <laughs> test your mics, rebattery your line amps. And if you're not a good skier, it's a trudge. <laughs> and that was me. So... Uh. <clears throat> Parabolic mic. Uh, I stole this off the internet. I was looking for some good information on this. Believe it or not, the only people who had a, the only guy who had a good uh, description of parabolic reflector on the internet is a birder. The guy records bird calls because uh, guys who record bird calls also need a highly directional microphone. Uh, incoming sound does all converge at a focal point at which place you, you, you set up your microphone. And uh, the downside of the parabolic reflector is that its frequency response is uh, very heavily towards high mids. There's not a lot of low end response. And I, if, if I'm not mistaken, it has to do with uh, the, wave, the wavelengths and, and what actually gets reflected off the dish. Only wavelengths that get reflected off the dish are affected and are effective. Uh, so, and what's behind the dish then bounces off, sound behind the dish bounces off in the other direction and is completely rejected. It's about the, as good a rejection as you can get because it physically rejects the sound from even getting anywhere near the microphone. The, the actual capsule is pointing that way. The actual capsule is pointing this way. Yeah. So, is that a problem? Is your passive? Uh, I think. Uh, I, I, I think an omnidirectional works best, and, and my best guess for why that is, is that some of the reflections in a cardioid mic will end up being uh, rejected, and you want to pick up all those, all those reflections. Uh, you, you'd think that maybe a cardioid would give you a little extra rejection point in here. I, I, I don't think it really does. So uh, an omnidirectional actually is very effective in a thread. Uh, football mic placement is exactly what you think. You want to try to cover all areas of the field. That's kind of a boring slide. But this is a shot of a, a, a parabolic uh, operator. And you can see uh, the, the dish is collecting sound from this side. The microphone is positioned here. There's a bar that comes across with a, uh, 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 another bar that goes in here. To, to, and that allows you to focus the distance of that microphone. Uh, from, from the dish itself. Uh, these electronics on the side are uh, 
uh, well, there's, a, there's an RF transmitter at the top. It's, a, it's when, when possible, it's, it's, you free up your parabolic operators by letting them run uh, wireless. And on the side then, you use, again, a line amp and a headphone amp so that they can actually listen to what they're picking up uh, so they know what to point at. These are extremely uh, finicky. If you, if you tilt it down just a little bit, you're miking the grass right in front of you. And if you tilt it back just a little too far, you're miking the stands across, across the way. And in a football stadium, it's a uh, pretty loud environment. So uh, it's, it's, it's an amazingly focused uh, pickup. Uh, I usually try to coach the guys into, into getting a quarterback call and then also staying on that spot long enough to hear the shoulder pads crunching. And then the guy downfield to work for any receptions or whatever. So that you, you have the two guys on one side of the field actually working as a team. And then how, do those, uh, how do those get blended back into the mix? If you've got, you know. Crowd mics, band, crowd mics, band mics, everything, uh, handheld camera mics, everything else. This becomes your primary on field microphone. Okay. Uh, because the frequency response is so limited. I try to I try to blend these with a lot of crowd, uh, so they kind of sound almost natural. These sort of kind of almost sounds almost natural, but that one maybe why it boosted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I'm not sure if we're doing it right, but it's the way we've been doing it for a long time. So uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody will come up with a better way of getting that getting in inside there and having the uh, ambience more natural. From, from the microphone. I, I don't know. I think sometimes you're just, we're just dealing with physical limitations. Right. It's an extremely loud environment. We're trying to hear something that's 30 yards away. Uh, it, it's amazing you can hear anything. And, and, uh, and do we need to hear it? That's the other question. Uh, right. Directors want to hear it. So then we do need to hear it. So that's, that, I guess that's the answer. So the answer is yes, we need to hear it. That's that's a little closer up on the on the microphone. That, that picks up air swearing really well on the uh, sideways. I was watching one page this game and picked up since you just keep dropping a handful of frogs. Well well you can see there's gonna be players lined up here, right? These guys aren't allowed to get in front of the players ever. So there's only a certain amount amount downfield they can get. So now they're pointing the microphone upfield, and there's football players on the field yelling across the field. So you're going to pick that up. <laughs> it is what it is. And uh, I have more slides. If you guys want to go back and talk more signal flow with slides as well, uh, but uh, but that's what I have on miking for now. Unless you guys have more questions. Yeah. Yippee, I made slides. <laughs> I got to go back quite a bit, though. Sorry. You have a teaching computer. I do, I do. I, it's, it runs Windows 98. I'm very proud of that, actually. Are the uh, parabolic operators, would those be considered A2s, or that's a separate job in itself? It's, uh, they're sometimes called A3s, believe it or not. Uh, but they're not paid as well as your typical A2, unfortunately. Best seat in the house. In fact, some, you know, yeah, that, well, that's the sell point, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times these are given to uh, college students, and sometimes you can you can get away with paying a college student about 50 bucks if they get that kind of seat at, at either a big time college game or at Gillette Stadium. Right. So, yeah. How are you usually communicating with your um, your A2s? Are you guys just walkies or? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in a, in a uh, set location uh, where, for instance, the announce booth, <coughs> we'll use uh, uh, belt pack communication uh, with the RTS system. So he's tied right into my communication system with the truck. Uh, at, at a uh, uh, remote location, field effects and stuff like that, walkie-talkies or even cell phones. Cell phones have become a major a major point of. Uh, well, I might have, I might have gone too far, but I, I think I think I actually want to come back a ways to get into. Uh, I 
I'll actually blow through uh, some of this other signal flow to get into the, to the communication system. In yellow are uh, communication sources. Uh, RTS is the big manufacturer. RTS is now a subsidiary of Telex. Uh, the IFB is a f announcer listen, which is interruptible by truck personnel. Uh, you can cut into their program and give them directions. The uh, stage manager and statistician, you could add an audio, an A2 in this case. And these uh, come right into the communication system, the RTS communication system in the truck. Uh, you don't need to see that or that. Uh, this doesn't show any communications, but this does a little bit. Play-by-play -play headset uh, feeds into a talkback box. Uh, the talkback, I guess, is part of the communication system in a sense. The, the microphone output is bused to the console. By pushing the switch, the uh, announcer can... Uh, changed his mic, mute, it mutes actually the microphone output and opens up the talkback channel. The talkback channel is a way for the announcer to talk to truck personnel. So if he pushes this button, and Don Orsillo pushes that button while Jerry Remy's talking, he can say, uh, you know, hey, hey Mike, uh, where are we going after this package? Uh, and we won't hear it on the air. Now Mike's able to talk to him again, through the IFB. Mike has a button that comes into his headset, interrupts one year of listen on his headset, and he can give instructions then to Don Orsillo in this case. Uh, post position again uh, with uh, IFB feeds, in this case, a uh, smaller pack, a, a belt pack for the announcer to wear. Uh, and uh, a little earbud comes up. You guys have all seen them fiddling with the ear little earbuds. Uh, only one, one channel is used in the earbud, and that's the interrupt side. That's the side that uh, Mike Narachi can, can interrupt and talk to these guys on. The RTS assignment, again, this is a little bit more complicated, but it's the way that all of the production personnel on the crew are talking with each other. And there's uh, multiple channels of communication going on at any one time. Uh, the person on the floor has, you have the ability to give them up to two of those channels. Uh, so, so they're very limited, but typically you give them a stage manager on one side, which talks to the producer, maybe the director on the other side, or, or maybe just a program on the other side. Oh, I'm going to go back this real quick. Um, how many of you studio guys hang your mics upside down outside this on routine? Anyway, that's... I think it's funny the way we treat microphones. Uh, how, how the IFB works, a uh, station like that, and I'm, I'm taking a little step back because a lot of this is now done uh, digitally. Uh, the, the, the modern communication system actually has incorporated the IFB into the digital matrix within, within the system. <clears throat> this is the traditional way of doing it. Uh, up to three different programs are sent into this, this device uh, the interrupt panels, which would show up in front of directors, producers, the A1, other truck personnel, also feed into this device. So now their microphones come in. Uh, the announcer on a headset or on an earbud is listening by default to one of the programs. And you assign the programs, it's hard to see, but you assign uh, the, the program uh, right here, and, there, and there's th three choices, one, two, or three. So you could build them a stereo mix, for instance, if you wanted, because uh, this is the interrupt and non-interrupt side of the program. Uh, so by default, they're listening to whatever program you fed, but as soon as someone hits the key panel, and, uh, IFB1's output is controlled here, two, three, and four. If someone hits a key panel for IFB1, now the person listening on IFB1, that listen on the interrupt side is interrupted, and the microphone from this person on the panel can give them instructions. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not that complicated for, for how it works. But it'll, it allows you to build uh, different mixes for different announcers. 
and have uh, four IFBs on, on one unit like this. Now, you see that this, this, this talk panel actually has 12 talks. <clears throat> so three of these units can be ganged together to have up to 12 different IFB mixes. And on, on a big show in the analog world, that's, exa that's exactly what you do. You, you might have up to 12 different IFB locations, so different points where an, a, 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 the uh, director could key in. Booth, uh, third base host, first base host, RF host, locker room position, uh, you, you name it. Pick, pick one and, and you'd have these different locations. Uh, are you mixing with your headphones so when, when you're in the truck? You're doing the stereo mix, you're doing the surround mix, so you also have the headphones on for instruction? I, I actually don't wear headphones. Some guys will wear a lightweight <coughs> headphone on yeah. one ear. Uh, I find it gets in a way of perspective in your mixing. I listen actually to the director and producer. Uh, I, I take the microphone output from their station and patch that into a little side speaker. So I listen to everything the director and producer have to say on a side speaker. In the old days, I used to always put them behind me and mix in front of me. As time's gone on and we're mixing in surround now, I try to find a place to put those speakers that make sense so that they sonically are not getting in the way of, of the mix. But obviously, I'm listening to these guys bark at me and everybody else all day. It interferes with my ability to actually do a, a, a good well, mix. I guess right? you can do that because you're in a truck, but if you're doing a live, something live or you're in front of a house or something, and I've had this happen where you have this big thing and people are just yelling on one side, and you need to have a good mix, but you also need to always pay attention Fun, isn't it? <laughs> it? It goes against what you think, too. I, a one time in my whole career, I had, I was doing uh, Canadian hockey, and they actually, and the producer and director both spoke French, and so they actually had an interpreter stand next to me the whole game, and just tell me what the audio cues were. It was brilliant. <laughs> She had a headset on and was listening to them. I didn't have to listen to a damn thing they said again. I got to sit there and actually mix the show. Uh, so, and she had to do all the interpretation of what was an audio call and all this for me. So I only heard what I needed to hear. And you'd be 95, 98% of what these guys say doesn't pertain to me at all. Uh, so you have to. It, it becomes a skill to actually filter these guys out while you're while you're working. Yeah. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> how how hard is it to pay attention to your mix if you get really into the game? Because you have. I'm taking you have a video feed in front of you so you can actually see what's going on. Um, I think it's good that when I got into the business, I wasn't a sports fan. Uh, and that's that's not just because of getting into the game while mixing it, but also as an A2. Uh, early on, uh, as an A2, I was miking up a lot of important players. Uh, and if I knew who the hell they were, it might have made a difference to how I reacted around them. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't give a shit that it was Raymond Bork. I was just pissed at the guy because I had to stick my arm up his jersey with a lavalier mic in my hand so it wouldn't get all wet from all his sweat. If I'd have known he was a legend at that time, I, I might have treated him differently and then we might have had a different relationship. But I'm saying that as, as it would be a bad thing. I, I, it was better that he was just another guy that I had to work with. Uh, I think it helps focus on the job. I, I think it was good that I became a sports fanatic at least a Red Sox fanatic later on when I, I could actually separate my emotion from the job I was doing. B because it's important. I, I, I did get in trouble uh, one time. I was doing the Yankee broadcast, and uh, late in the game, the Red Sox won, like with a walk-off hit or something. And you think you're isolated in the audio room, and I, woo, you know, one of those. And... Uh, they weren't very happy with me from the production. They understood, but they weren't very happy with me. It wasn't a very professional thing to do. And I think it's important to stay professional on, on those. Uh, 
I'm, I've been lucky that I've been able to get away with a few lapses over the, my career, and I have still, uh, the people still call me. It's crazy. Uh, anyway, I, I want to get, I'll get back to communications. Uh, I talked router, that's, that's basically audio. Uh, <clears throat> the, the producer director station, this, this panel or a panel like this sits in front of uh, the key personnel in the truck. Uh, using uh, the, uh, and, and basically everything, every microphone source, every channel, every listen source goes into the intercom matrix these days. Using a computer uh, with some software, you can assign what each channel on this intercom station is going to listen to. And it, it used to be you were locked into 12 separate <coughs> channels. But now you literally can have this station have a channel that only talks to one other station. And then you have comms channels where it's basically, you know, I probably have a better slide to show that. This is probably a better slide to show that. So these would be the key panels in the truck, and, they're, and they go into the matrix. Control of the matrix is done with a computer interface. Uh, these can all be assigned as individual channels on somebody else's deck. Uh, of an example, I, if this is the audio panel, this panel's in front of the lead tape operator. I sometimes, in the middle of a show, need to communicate with the lead tape operator to say something like, uh, hey, is this next source a stereo source, or is this on channel one or channel two only? You know, or is this next source, he's getting a tape machine ready, should I be looking for this on channels one and two or channels three and four? That kind of communication. During, during the show even. And we don't have to disrupt anybody else, anything else that's going on. Uh, there's also comms party line channels. And in this case, the party line channels go through a two to four wire interface. This is a four wire meaning separate, separate talk, separate listen on each channel. The two to four wire converts it into more like a phone line. On a phone line, you have a talk and listen on one, one pair of wires, a two wire. Uh, so you make the interface of up to 12 party lines, and now your external people can be assigned to up to two of those 12 party lines. And I, I want to try to simplify this for just a second. Channel one or party line one is typically a camera interface. So our director, by being on the camera channel, can now talk to our camera operators. Now the cameras aren't actually on a belt pack, but it's the same kind of arrangement. So they're assigned, their belt packs are all assigned to channel one. Channel one then corresponds to party line one in this system, which is the internal truck system. So now our director can talk to the camera engine, uh, camera operators. Camera operators can talk to our director. Channel two of party lines is typically for stage managers. These are a floor director, someone who's on, in next to announcers at a specific position. Again, we can assign channel two to whichever uh, internal uh, stations we want. And then they're on the party line, which is, a two, again, a, 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 a two wire line with all our stage managers. Uh, so typically you'd have six to, uh, six to 10, 12, six to 10 probably party lines on a, on a regular show, on a, on a mid-size show. Those interconnect and then these, these folks are able to talk either on the party line or point to point. They, they would call that a point to point communication director to producer, director to technical director, director to audio engineer, audio engineer to Elvis operator. All of that magic stuff's done in here. All of that magic stuff is edited and assigned from the computer. So it's great. I can, if I have a laptop with an ethernet in the audio room and we're connected to the internal network, I can make changes, including changing the names of what these things are called. Because these, these actually are, you can't see it here, but they're little LEDs and you got names on them. And also engineering can make those changes. And you see too, 
I'll be right with you, Chris. You see that the IFB system then in the modern setup is also hooked up off of this, off of this master so that you can assign, instead of assigning to a particular channel or point to point, you assign a string of these buttons to be your interrupts for your announcers. I see heads nodding. That means I guess I'm explaining this okay. It's, a, it's the wiring between all this shit is a little bit more complicated. And I've never done that. Uh, but uh, that, that's the basis of, of how it all operates. The phone interface is a two to four wire interface. What that's doing is that allows us to interconnect with another system like this back at the television station. Or in, if you're doing the Olympics, it allows a master command center to have a telephone interface that connects with a system like this in every one of the locations. So now, uh, uh, for instance, <clears throat> ESPN has this system at in in-house. Their different channels, which might each go through an interface, might say location one, location two, location three, location four, uh, during college football weekend. And they might even change the names of them, so that's Boston, New York, Cincinnati, Cleveland, whatever it is. Now they can talk to the, through the phone interface with the director or producer in the truck at the other end. It's cool. <laughs> Chris, you had a question? Yeah, just kind of like on the truck side of it. Yeah. Is there, um, are there like separate rooms for everything? Like there's a room for the audio that like you're in, and the director has his own room. Yeah, that slide I showed you that was all messed up was an overhead view of that. Uh, uh, and <laughs> I'm not sure what happened to it. Uh, I'm going to take the blame because it's a Windows 98 machine. Uh, typical audio room. And I showed you a picture earlier of a typical production room. So, and, and usually these uh, locations are separated by walls in the truck. Usually there's a way to walk through from one location to the other with, with clo you know, closable doors or whatever. And it really depends on the truck company, how they laid it out. Uh, I've seen them laid out all, all different kind of ways, yeah. The, the uh, director has a, uh, met kind of your, his audio mix is getting from you to the same mix that's going to air. But what, what if he wants to, or she wants to hear uh, like a microphone on the field that's not going to air at that, at that moment? Is there another speaker you put in there with an aux? I'm glad I made this slide. <laughs> uh, in almost every station now in the truck, uh, auxiliary speakers, Wooler is the company that makes the most of these. Uh, this, this is an example of a four-channel auxiliary speaker system. And into this, I, I talked about the talkback circuit for the announcer to be able to talk to the producer off air. When the, when the talent hits the talkback switch, that mic is routed uh, through a preamp, usually, uh, to one of these, these speakers. And that speaker will stay on all the time, but will be quiet unless an announcer hits the talkback switch. And when, they, when he does that, the sound from the program from that microphone is, is muted, and the director will hear that from a separate speaker. Uh, so, some other examples, the mix minus I talked about, which would be the studio show that's going on, director might want to listen to that in, in a, an aux speaker so that when there's a two-way conversation going on between the host at the studio and our people on site, the director can listen to both signals. We don't want both signals in our mix, right? but the director wants to hear it. Uh, a, a good example, and I think this might be where you were getting at, if we have a host on an RF mic, <coughs> the host is invisible at some location, uh, maybe setting up for an interview or a commentary on, on the event that's going on. Um, Heidi Watney was talking to Dustin Pedroia before the game. Some part of that conversation became relevant during the game. She wants to say something to uh, the, the producer, uh, but her mic's not open. 
her mic would be open all the time, if she unmutes the RF mic then, he, the producer would hear her in this auxiliary speaker. She could say to him, you know, hey, I want to make a comment on Dustin Pedroia using the IFB return. Uh, he could say, okay, hang on a second. I'm going to have Don throw it to you. And at that point, he, you know, so he can, he can set up the entire process. Yeah, of that. just have those host mics open all the time going to the, the wall. Yeah, well, that's the danger of this. And that's where uh, actually R RF comes in. If you're using a good RF mic with a good signal and just have a mute switch on the RF. Now, of course, this is exactly the reason. This is not the audio guy's fault. When they go to a shot of the host going, <laughs> it's because the host forgot to unmute their damn microphone. Uh, and I see that all the time, and it's, it's actually very funny when it happens. But see, Greg Dickerson's great for that. You had a question? Yeah. Um, how do you deal with the frequency response in these trucks? I mean, it's like, you know, getting, getting the sound right for the mix, um, making sure that it translates to the listener at home. Um, I get lucky, I guess. Uh, no, uh, that's a good question because mixing environments vary from truck to truck. Uh, it would probably be best if I brought along a pair of reference speakers to every mixing job I ever did and mixed to them. Uh, and I know studio guys will do that. They'll carry around a pair of NS10s or whatever. They'll always have a reference. It's a little bulky. Sometimes I'm, I have to park two miles from the work site. It's a, be a lot to carry around a pair of NS10s through the rain or snow to, to the site. Uh, so I, I do what, what I think is a strategy for a lot of live sound engineers, which is bring along some CDs of some material I'm familiar with, uh, response-wise, listen to that, listen to the response of the loudspeakers, and try to tune, tune to that. And then the other thing is to try to not make too many adjustments and trust your instincts a little bit. Uh, if I find I'm cutting too deep into EQ one day, and this is this would be a mental thought, not if I if I it sounds like I need to cut too deep, deeper than I usually would, I, I usually will will ease back and say, well, you know what, that's probably the monitors or li listening environment. Uh, it's 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 not doesn't really need that much of a correction. Uh, so I try to keep my EQ to a minimum and try to work off of mic placement and, root and routine to try, to try to keep that consistent. It's, what's great these days is a lot more trucks are putting in really nice gentle X. And uh, that, it, it's brilliant when you're mixing on a good set of speakers. It, it, it sounds good when you're in the gentle X. A lot of people on the Yeah, yeah. I, I usually do that when I can. If if the console and the truck allow me to have a uh, a second pair of Q speakers, like a, a small pair of Fostec speakers or something, uh, I I do like to check my mix on a smaller pair of speakers too, because my dad's setup isn't that good, and I want to make sure he'd be okay with it. You know. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, when the mix is completed, do you worry about the compression on the master? You let the the company deal with that when it gets to them before they broadcast it. Uh, that's, a, that's another good question, too. I think I used to worry more about that than I do now. Uh, now I, I'm really trying to use the dynamic range available to me, and I'm trying to give them a, a mix that's got some, that, that, that's, that's forward with announcers, but also has some dynamics to it. And uh, I've given up. I know that some places I'm sending my mix are going to squish the daylights out of it, and I'm doomed, and then other places that I'm sending my mix aren't going to touch a damn thing as, as long as I don't peek out. Uh, and, uh, you know, you just just do the best with what you got. So there's something on there. That yeah, I, I've, I've heard mixes butchered, and, and now it's, television's a funky thing. Uh, you mentioned you had trouble with Nesson baseball at some point. That might not be from Nesson. The Nesson feed goes through Comcast to get to me. And Comcast, when they, they have the, the way they're setting up the signal to go to the multiple channels, the way they're, because they're sending all those. One mic, 
all those channels are coming down one one piece of cable, a piece of wire. They have to they have to set all that stuff too, and they might have hard limiters in line somewhere too that are acting funky or some frequency response anomalies or whatever. So I, I don't know if you guys. I guess in New Bedford, I get the opportunity sometimes to balance between a Boston station and a Providence station on the same exact broadcast. Picture quality and sound quality vary a lot from the same broadcast on the Boston station and the Providence station. And, uh, it, and it, it, I'm not saying, I don't know which one is better either way, but I, I've made those comparisons several times on you know Fox, NBC, CBS, ABC, whatever it is, from a national broadcast and the sound quality will vary. It's, it's, it's tragic in a way. I guess, I guess direct TV is better uh, in that case, but I, I got cable. What are you gonna do? Announcers, you've got to hear the announcers. Grandma's got to be able to understand what the announcers are saying. Period. If you get that much done, you're half, you're more than halfway there. That's 90% of your mix. Uh, balancing out the stereo, getting a good surround mix, all the rest of that is uh, is bonus. That's, that's the difference between being new to it and, and having done it for a long time. Uh, the most important thing is grandma can hear the announcers, and if a director calls for a, for a cue, you got to be on it. And, and, and that's 90% that's of your job right there. It, it's, it's really funny. The, you can get away with a horrible sounding Nat sound mix. If, but if, every, if, if, all, if you make the transitions when the director calls for them, and, Every, everything an announcer says all game is heard, you've done a pretty decent job. So all, all the rest of that is, is, uh, is, is you know, it's, uh, I don't know, icing on the cake. Yeah. I heard an interesting fact, I don't know if it's true about you, that you know, as, as like someone on hockey wing, as, as the players go around, that you slide the faders as you go. I just wanted to know if that's true or you just kind of leave them off. Hockey is one of my favorite sports to mix because I'm uh, always moving faders, and I'm trying to uh, trying to transition uh, invisibly the ambience from one mic to the other, which is why I love having uh, six matched PCCs on the ice. I try to EQ them identically, and uh, I try to only have one mic open at a time, and I, I'm opening one mic and closing the other at the same time so I can make that transition as invisible as possible. And, and the, re the reason, again, the reason for that is that uh, a puck hitting, uh, the, the PCC picks up so well on the ice, a puck hitting on, on one side is picked up on the other side and, there, and you end up losing some intelligibility when you're picking up the same sound from multiple, sort, you know, multiple points. So I always try to keep that in mind. Yeah, I'm actually working. Uh, the, my my bed in that case is a crowd mic, crowd mic bed that, that I, I mix to, and I, you can use that to hide your transitions. Uh, you, if you you can use that uh, effectively, and I and I try to do that with with anything I'm mixing is to try to hide. In basketball, I'm generally going from one one net to the next net, and trying to trying to make that invisible too. Sometimes you add a center mic. Oh, oh, stole the ball. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, in hockey, it's fun for me because you, you uh, really want to be opening the microphone that the player and the puck are headed towards, not the one that they're there already, because it's a much better sound as they're coming towards the mic than if they're going away from the mic. So, uh, subtle, subtle stuff. Again, it's more important to hear the announcers. Uh, how much do you guys deal with the on-site like guys who are in PA and stuff? You have to like talk to them to figure out what's going to be happening. Um, it depends on depends on the venue. Um, most cases, I'm just getting a simple PA feed from somebody, so that we can hear the uh, national anthem if it's required. You know, if we if we cover that in the show, uh, very it's very seldom when I actually need to go to the PA in a, in, a, in a venue. A few exceptions though in hockey and and uh, football, the referees are miked. 
and the camera will shoot the referee when he's making the call into the PA, and you definitely want to hear that. Uh, another sport where you have to make a little bit, a couple more uh, tennis. It's it's very important, and uh, because the ump chair is mic'd for the PA and also for you, and in boxing because of the ring announcer. Do you guys use separate mics or you split the same mic? Usually, usually you're splitting the splitting the signal. Yeah. Where is the? Is there, there's different shows for the like home to home. Yeah. Who does the split? Where is the splitter? Is it? <clears throat> it would be, it would be, you would think that we would do it correctly and we would have a central location where we had a nice split with ISO transformer outs going to the, to the away truck and the direct outs going to the home truck. Uh, most of the time, we take direct outs from uh, one, of the bo- one of the boards. Literally take the direct outs from the home board, patch, take a line level signal into the away board. Uh, when there's ground issues, uh, you gotta you gotta dance around that. But you can use isolation transformers again from one truck to the other truck. Make sure you do pin one lifts and, and things like that. But it, it, it's amazing how often it works where you just take the just take direct outs. In some cases too, uh, and a good example is Fenway. There's a home show, maybe an away show a Japanese language show, uh, and uh, a uh, MLB.com or MLB show. So now there's four shows going on side by side, sharing multiple cameras and sharing all those microphone sources. Uh, So the the home show engineer would be responsible then for DAing all those microphones and making sure they get matched to the correct people. Yeah. In terms of baseball, with 82 games at home, are you the primary guy doing all those home games? I would assume Nesson would want some consistency. Nesson, Nesson has a guy named Pete Grenier who mixes all of their baseball, all of their hockey, and he also mixes all of CSN's basketball. And he's been doing that for 15 or so years. I used to work side by side with him. I, I'm now full time at the New England Institute of Art. So I, I'm just a part-timer now in this uh, television stuff. I do, I'm a weekend warrior. Uh, but uh, for, for a, a good chunk of time, I, I sat in the truck next to Pete with his feeds, and we worked together. Uh, he'd, he'd do the home show, and I'd do the away show. Yeah. I don't know what time it is, Tony. I have a, one more question. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. Um, I'm a recent grad of CDIA, Walton, yeah. and they did not talk about any of this stuff. So, I'm, you know, you said you weren't a sports fanatic. I'm a huge sports fanatic, but I was kind of going down the music road. However, I find this very interesting. What is your advice for me in terms of starting out, whether it's an internship or low entry level? Um, how do I get going on this? You could try ESPN, CSN, or Nesson for an internship. Uh, if you're, you know, you could also try working for one of the crewing companies and start out as a utility and work your way up. It's uh, are those, it's those local companies. You're yeah, those were the local com- companies. companies. Yeah, I can I can uh, give you some information on that. It's a challenging business to break into, and I'll be honest, I've made it more difficult in the past couple of years because I placed some students in the business. Uh, so the uh, ranks of local A2s have filled up qu- quite a lot in the last couple of years. The other thing that's challenging is it's hard. We don't have a lot of young blood in the A1 uh, camp. And I, th- I think it was easier when I was young to break into that. There were a lot more, s- the shows were simpler and there were a lot more of the simpler variety shows. I think it's much more challenging to break in today because you're expected right away to, to know uh, not only analog boards, but also you know the Yamaha PM1D, the, the Calrec Alpha and Sigma, and, the, and some of the SSL digital boards as you walk in. Uh, uh, and maybe sometimes even a Euphonics. Uh, so uh, plus all of the, all of this stuff that I wrote down today, I've never written down before. <laughs> 
Uh, it's always been up in my head, and, and as the shows have gotten more complicated, I've just piled more stuff in here. I, I, you would think that I would show up to a show with a checklist. I got to do this, check this, check this, check. I just show up and start patching stuff and asking the right questions, and somehow I manage to make a show happen every day. It, so it, I, and to build that kind of knowledge base takes time. So. It's a lot, it was a lot easier when the shows were smaller and the communication was simpler and there were only two tape machines, not, not 40. Uh, so, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, Rick? Speaking of different boards, uh, going from analog to digital, uh, how has the, the, the digital board changed how you work? Uh, I, it, that's, that's, a, that's another great question. I don't know if it has. Uh, the kind of problems that you run into are different on a digital board than an analog board. Uh, I get very frustrated when I have to touch more than two buttons to get to a particular function uh, when I'm mixing live. I, I do like the fact that I can save a lot of my settings on a digital board. It can save some time. There have been times when I've had settings saved, gone to a show the next time, and actually had built a trap for myself. Uh, sometimes it's, there's, there's something to be said for having a normal board and an empty patch field when you show up and building it all from scratch because if something goes wrong, you've already thought through that process that day. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think the biggest changes are real obvious. There's a few less patch cords uh, when... Uh, when digital sources are routed directly into the board and you just have to assign them to a fader. Uh, but, and the signal flow, I, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer once it's digital to leave it digital. I, I don't like to uh, turn something analog just to process it to bring it back to a digital board. So I, I'll concede and just work with in-board in, in, in compressors, EQs, et cetera. So, so you mentioned all these, all these sources that you have to work with. And, and complexity of the, of the shows, I mean, that means more channels, so have the boards gotten bigger as, as time goes by? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And do you need more, does that mean more faders as well, or just more layers? I prefer to have more faders. Uh, you know, obviously you don't need access to 80 channels of tape all the time, so some of that can be buried on, on, on bottom layers. It gets really frustrating, though, when you're with your net sound mics, and your announcer mics, you know, people talking on their mics, if those are buried in another layer. Uh, the only thing I like to bury is a, is a backup. Uh, and I like to bury that right underneath on the same fader, on the same uh, channel uh, the, as, the, as a primary source. And I like to be, and, and that's, that's another frustration I have with some, some of the digital architecture is that I like to be able to switch easily on a big button from A layer to B layer, as opposed to a global switch. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I think that's pretty universal with live with live mixers. We we like to have a, a fader in front of us that controls every source that we got. It's it's hard. It's 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 disturbing to bury things. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. It's been it's been an interesting challenge to learn all to learn all these different boards. The, the good news is, is that actually recently they're getting simpler. I think uh, they're, uh, uh, people who are manufacturing broadcast uh, uh, boards are listening to uh, us guys who are, who are actually mixing and, uh, and they're actually making adjustments. They're, they're making more available on the surface for us, and, which is very nice, very kind of them. Anybody else? I, how, how are we doing on time, Tony? I, okay, because I've got, I could probably talk longer. <laughs> uh, is it 10? Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it open to final questions if anybody's got. If this was New York, I'd say you have to be in a, new, a union, either NAVIT, IBEW or uh, IATSE. Uh, Boston has yet to unionize 
sports television camera crew there was a there was a push a few years ago to go to i o c and it didn't go so as of today everyone in the everyone in boston is still still on a freelance basis this guy's frozen time